It's me. I'm the sixth guy on the thumbnail. I'm gonna go ahead and remove this, but it's not because I'm scared of the consequences of smoking. Because I'm scared of my landlady. You may have noticed my new look. I'm going through a, a bit of a phase right now after playing Yakuza. Whoa, 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 hold on. Did you just say Yakuza? Come on, Magilar, you gotta know it's Yakuza. Is that a spectral voice correcting my Japanese pronunciation? Anyway, this new aesthetic, this upgrade, is a direct result of my inspiration from Kazuma Kuryu. Really? Kazuma Kuryu. That's the best you got. Okay, so that's for sure the dulcet tones of Avalanche Reviews correcting my pronunciation. Listen, I'm doing an intro, man. Hey, listen, I'm just trying to save you from a comment section that will come for blood. Believe me. Uh, yeah, you're looking at Mr. Mass Immune. Don't you think I know that? Remember the third Resident Evil movie? Well, I called one of its characters Walmart instead of Kmart. I kid you not, my grandchildren will be paying for that mistake. Oof. Yeah, that's brutal. I tell you what, let me have a look at the list of names you gotta pronounce, and maybe we can work our way through it. Wow, a chance to bone up on my Japanese grammar from a guy who literally lives in Japan? This is an awesome opportunity. Let me just grab my sheet here. Okay, so I think we can start here in Tsukimino with karaoke song names, and then we can move over to Nagasugai and the... Why even offer then? Why would a disembodied voice even need to use a door? You know, everybody's got something to say, but nobody's willing to help. This is where I live, okay? It's a miracle of modern technology that I even know Japan exists. So I'm gonna say it however I want, okay? In fact, I might go out of my way to pronounce it wrong, just to see how you react. How do you like that? I'm just kidding, I'm gonna try my best, please don't go. Why the fifth game? I haven't reviewed the first, second, third, fourth, or zeroth game in the Yakuza series, so doesn't looking at the fifth game seem kind of arbitrary? To the untrained eye, perhaps, but I promise you, a world-class risk analysis was performed for this decision. After months of rigorous market testing, I and my colleagues decided that if the world ends tomorrow, the one Yakuza game I'd like to have talked about is five. New York is the most popular tourist destination in the United States. If you want the glitz and glamour of Hollywood, you go to California. If you want to see old men's heads carved into rocks, you go to South Dakota. If you're in witness protection, you also go to South Dakota. However, if you want the broad, unfettered American experience, you go to New York. Yakuza 5 is the broad, unfettered Yakuza experience. But that leads us down a dark alleyway. The good news is that, unlike being in New York, we're gonna come out the other side unscathed but I feel I've got some responsibility to fill you in. Now, what is Yakuza? Actually, let's go one step further. What is THE Yakuza? All right, all right, I'm getting ahead of myself. In the most general sense possible, the Yakuza is often explained as the Japanese Mafia. Honestly, you could describe any criminal organization as the insert nationality here Mafia if you're being reductive, so let's clarify. The existence of the Yakuza can be traced as far back as the 1600s, but it wasn't until a hundred or so years later when the group formally began organizing into different family structures and syndicates. Codes of conduct were established and the Yakuza began to engage in different, although typically illicit, activities. They controlled gambling dens, engaged in extortion, racketeering, and ran prostitution rings, just as some examples. Over the years, the various organizations within the Yakuza have become ubiquitous in Japanese society, enjoying this freedom to operate in the open, often with legitimate ties to business such as real estate. Go there! Starting in the 1990s, the Japanese government began to crack down on illegal Yakuza activities. This forced large families such as the Yamaguchi Gumi to restrict their members' open involvement in those illegal activities. It seems as though Japan is in the twilight years of the Yakuza's existence, that there's just no place for the organization in the modern world. Such as our propensity as human beings, the Yakuza have been romanticized in books, movies, anime, and of course, video games. Yakuza the video game series, known in Japan as Ryuga Gotoku, or Like a Dragon, is one such piece of fiction. These games are silly as fuck. For every ounce of serious crime drama in the series, there's a gallon of absurdity. That's one reason why Yakuza has historically not done so well in the West, but it's also what defines Yakuza as a franchise. It's a walking contradiction, part sincere and part meta-fiction? 
Now, Yakuza's fortune in the West began to change in 2017 with Yakuza Zero. Zero acts as a series prequel, taking place in the 1980s. This allowed the writers to essentially start fresh, eschewing the increasingly convoluted story, along with its exhaustive list of characters and locations. Yakuza Zero was a huge critical success, remaining the series' best-selling game to date and acting as an introduction to the world of Yakuza for many. Now, what did it do differently? Well, aside from some general improvements to the gameplay, what won so many people over was the story. The goofiness is subdued, still there, but less prevalent, making way for a legitimately gripping crime drama, perhaps the most realistic and grounded in the series, and a fan favorite. The 1980s Japanese aesthetic is iconic, the combat systems are fun, and it's a game I'd urge you to play if you enjoy stories of brotherhood, hope, and betrayal. It's also not the game I'm talking about today. There it is, Yakuza 5. This game was originally released in 2012, in Japan. It wouldn't be until 2015 that the West would see it localized. It might be hard to imagine given the sheer volume of Yakuza games we're getting in the West these days, but yeah, back then the series wasn't really on publisher Sega's priority list. There are any number of reasons Sega may not have had a vested interest in localizing Yakuza 5, but it's widely speculated that the Western sales of a series previous released contributed to the decision. I'm talking about Yakuza Dead Souls, a zombie apocalypse spin-off. It's, uh, it's pretty shitty. There will be 12 people in the comments who claim it's their favorite, but that goes for any game in this series. Sales numbers in the West for Dead Souls were abysmal. It's worth noting that localization is expensive. It's not just a matter of re-translating some text boxes and throwing it on store shelves. First of all, localization teams need to familiarize themselves with the tone of the scenes within the game. It's important to provide accurate but still coherent translation, not straying too far from the original writer's intent, but altering figures of speech or cultural references that may not be recognizable. There's also a matter of programming. Yeah, the game files themselves need to be modified for any number of reasons. Changing the number of dialogue boxes, altering certain graphics, and removing certain content that may be offensive to Western sensibilities. Finally, after all of the boots on the ground work is done, there's weeks of quality assurance, internal approval, international market bureaucracy, and manufacturing to be done. All in, if localization isn't being worked on parallel with development, it can take months of additional time and tens of millions of dollars. The bright minds in the Sega boardroom said, no, it's not that drab, mediocre zombie shooters are played out in the West, it's the children who are wrong. The Yakuza series localization was put on indefinite hiatus. <laughs> Children wept as they peered into Sega offices, seeing all the fun new series entries they wouldn't be getting. Ultimately, thanks to the petitions, campaigns, and public outcry from the West's niche Yakuza fanbase, Sega decided three years later, let them eat cake. The game was placed on the PS3's digital storefront, and though there's no shortage of Yakuza games for us to enjoy now, back then, it was a Christmas miracle. Oh well, shit, the game actually came out in December. Neat. I front-loaded the video with all of this information so you can get a sense for just how lucky we are. Of course, Sega has financially benefited from Yakuza's increased popularity, but at that time, it really did seem like the good times were over. Like us dumb Westerners would have to learn moon runes to keep up with the adventures of Papa Kiryu. And although it's taxing and strenuous for us to read subtitles, beggars can't be choosers. Well, actually, that's not entirely true. You do have some options if you want to play the series in English. You gonna squeal like a bitch, motherfucker. Unfucking believable! I suggest you listen to me. I suggest you blow me. Get ready to get fucked up, stupid fucking motherfucker. Mark Hamill literally doesn't remember voicing Majima. Before we get into Yakuza 5, let's have a brief series recap, just to bring us up to speed. Yakuza 1 begins in 1995. Series protagonist Kazuma Kiryu is sent to prison for a crime he did not commit. Why, who, what, where, when? Let's keep this a high-level overview. If you know, you know, and if you don't, well, you can always play the game later. 
Kiryu is released 10 years later. The year is 2005, and society is unrecognizable for poor Kiryu. Having been expelled from the Tojo clan, that is, the Yakuza organization he belongs to, he unravels various mysteries and suffers various tragedies along the way, including the loss of his love interest, Yumi. On the upside, he acquires a small Japanese human girl named Haruka, Yumi's daughter. Kiryu graciously accepts the responsibility of raising Haruka, and they become inseparable. Kiryu has a shirtless fight with his childhood friend, it rains money, and Kiryu, his innocence proven, becomes a legend in the Tojo clan. Yakuza 2's story is less important across the series. Kiryu becomes even more of a legend, and we flesh out the relationship between the Tojo clan and their rivals in the Omi Alliance. Also, Kiryu has a shirtless fight. Yakuza 3, this is where it gets odd, but hey, let's show reverence for our boy Kiryu here and just get down to brass tacks. Kiryu now runs an orphanage in Okinawa in a state of semi-retirement. See, Kiryu himself was an orphan. Not the orphanage. I used to be an orphan. You ain't got no mommy and you ain't got no daddy. You're an orphan! 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 And so he has a soft spot for orphans, a real heart of gold. Kiryu is dragged back into the Yakuza underworld after his own adoptive father, Shintaro Kazama, attempts to assassinate the leader of the Tojo clan, Daigo Dojima, despite himself being in the Tojo clan and also being dead. It's a ghost story. Of course, I'm only kidding. There's a perfectly logical explanation. Kazama had a long-lost twin brother in the CIA. Yes, the American CIA. Beautiful eyes, like I had from my brother before. Who, for various geopolitical reasons, needed some Yakuza dead. Kiryu has a shirtless fight with a cool but underdeveloped antagonist and becomes even more of a legend. Yakuza 4 introduces a whole bunch of new playable characters into the mix, all of whom will have their own time in the spotlight later on. Except for Tanimura. Sorry, Tanimura. Look, the plot twists in this game are fucking insane, but I feel there's a better time to revisit the minutia of Yakuza 4 since it's more closely tied with 5 than any other game in the series. There's a super badass scene of the main characters walking. They really do have giant hands, hey? Together, the lads defeat a corrupt police commissioner. Kiryu fights Dojima with minimal justification, but it is cool, I guess. It rains money again, Kiryu's legend grows, you get the picture. At the end, Kiryu is like, Daigo, now that you have tasted my fists of fury, you must do your best to make the Tojo clan proud, and make me proud. Then he disappears into the night, presumably to run his orphanage and live happily ever after. Yakuza 1 and 2 were written by a best-selling crime novelist by the name of Hase Seishu. I find that interesting and worth mentioning, because writing for video games is a very different beast than writing genre fiction, or even screenwriting for movies. The story of a game usually isn't a linear set of events occurring, and often Often the rising and falling action is dictated by the players themselves. Interactivity is the key word because it changes everything. Even in cases where a video game's story progression closely mirrors that of a movie, say a Metal Gear Solid game, liberties, sons of liberties, have to be taken. Probably shouldn't have left that one in the script. There are many things that need to be considered. Side quests, number of antagonists, how those things affect the character's relationship with the central conflict. There are so many examples, the list could go on forever. By the second game, the Yakuza series had found a strong identity, and it came from a place that you might not expect. In these games, there is a noticeable rift between the story being told and the game being played. In the vast majority of cases, this is the absolute last thing you would want as a developer. That inability to reconcile game with story is such a prevalent thing, game designer Clint Hawking actually came up with a name for it. Ludo narrative dissonance. If I could go back in time and convince Clint to pick something less long in the tooth, God knows I would, but this is what caught on. The phrase refers to that feeling of inconsistency between the game being played and the story being told, something that rips the player out of the game. Broken immersion is considered undesirable in video games, to say the least. But Ryoga Gotoku took this dichotomy and turned it into its own franchise. These melodramatic, soap opera quality stories marry this constant absurdity, this winking to and nudging of the player in a way that's funny and enthralling. You really do care about these characters, even if the situations they're in are batshit crazy. 
it's not for everyone, that much is clear. You either love this game for its inability to keep a straight face, or you detest it. There's really no room for compromise in this series. It is, unabashedly, a video game. While production values have ramped up in the industry and developers concern themselves with reducing the player's awareness that they're playing a game, Yakuza continues to go its own way, hearkening to a time in video game history when it was okay to just be a game. The CIA twin brother thing is still fucking stupid in context though, it's hard to excuse all of this stuff. Despite the tone of the series, which is often all over the place, I don't think any one game sets the appropriate mood quite like Yakuza 5 does. Daigo Dojima meets with one Tadashi Madarame, patriarch of the Yamagasa family. We learn that a chairman of the Omi Alliance has a terminal illness, and the vacuum caused by his death may lead to an all-out war between the Tojo and the Omi. Dojima has come to the city of Fukuoka to bolster support. As the two opposing factions stand against each other, there's a lot of tension in the air, and even if you don't know anything about Yakuza, you do get a sense of scale here. These aren't two slipshod groups fighting for scraps, these syndicates are organized and protective over their leadership. As Dojima considers the situation, he hails a cabbie, one named Taichi Suzuki. There's something familiar about this guy, but I can't quite put my finger on it. Maybe they shouldn't have let him wear aviators and a mask for his identification photo. Of course, Suzuki is series protagonist Kazuma Kiryu gone incognito. I guess it wasn't a reasonable ask for him to grow a mustache, but hey, a man can dream. Dojima knows it's Kiryu, and Kiryu knows that Dojima knows it's Kiryu, but the mask doesn't slip. Dojima uses this opportunity to talk about the impending war, as well as his concerns, frustrations, and insecurities. In light of all this, Kiryu gives him the best advice possible. Please leave, don't let the door hit your ass on the way out. In all seriousness, Dojima has spent much of the series leaning on Kiryu as a mentor, so this is Kiryu's way of saying, for once you can't depend on me, figure it out yourself. Point taken, Dojima continues on his way, and it's here where we see the routine Kiryu settled into. Grabbing some late night noodles, parking and washing the cab back at the depot, it's a normal life for our boy, a little too normal. He's taken on a new name and started fresh in a city in order to build distance from his adoptive daughter, Haruka, as she works towards her dream of becoming an idol. The culture surrounding Japanese pop idols wouldn't take too kindly to familial relationships with criminals. It's depressing, it's a low point for Kiryu. This guy is built for violence, so to see him rein it in, living this drab routine in an unfamiliar city, it's like seeing a caged lion at the zoo. He just doesn't belong here. In many ways we'll see this is the ultimate sacrifice for our boy. Speaking of Kiryu, let's talk about him. I've been trying to get to the bottom of what makes him a good character. Now, it's easy to see why he's likable. On top of being this indefatigable source of goodness and badassery, his stoic disposition just amplifies the game's ridiculous moments. <laughs> There are so many wacky characters in this series, especially in the side quests. Kiryu playing the straight man just allows Yakuza's weird side to shine through in hilarious ways. Even with that in mind, there is something deeper at work here. Kiryu is the heart of this series. Yeah, there have been games without him or where he takes a back seat, but the man has passed into legend. I can only speak for myself here, but I think it's because Kiryu is just an emblem of positive masculinity. His story as we know it begins with the idolization of his adoptive father, Kazama. Nice cars, slick suits, respect from his peers. For the orphan Kiryu, these superficial aspects of Kazama's character became his inspiration to join the Yakuza. And superficially, Kiryu is the ideal man. He's tall, strong, looks fine as fuck in a fundoshi and he's so confident he never breaks a sweat. He embodies virtues such as fairness and self-control, and while that makes him cool, it doesn't necessarily make him interesting. Kiryu is a flawed character. In situations where tact is a requirement, he's a fish out of water. He's not unintelligent, but he's got simple philosophies. They only encompass his own small bubble, his experience outside of which is pretty limited, but that doesn't stop him from trying. Throughout these games, the number of uncomfortable situations he finds himself in, or peculiar people he's introduced to is, well, it's a lot. However, Kiryu's desire for situational control and stability is outweighed by his desire to find the best possible outcome for everyone. And that means placing himself in vulnerable positions, being embarrassed or showing sides of himself he's not comfortable with. He doesn't always stick the landing, but he always tries to do what's best. He's open-minded towards the lives of others, but his personal principles are strong. There's a core within Kiryu that we as the player can rely on, a man who's been there since the beginning and will be there until the end. 
but Kiryu's left enough room for personal growth and compassion. Those are just my thoughts on what make him such a great character. In the form of a tutorial, we can now wander around this area of the city, Nagasugai, an area based on the real-life red light district of Nakasu. That's right, Yakuza 5, like the third game, doesn't actually begin in the series stomping grounds of Kamurocho. While having secondary cities to explore isn't exactly anything new, Yakuza 5 actually has tertiary, quaternary, and quinary cities as well. That can't be a word. Oh, there you go. One city for each playable character in the game, sort of. For this and many other reasons, Yakuza 5 is considered to be the most ambitious game in the series. Let's talk a little bit about Nagasugai, because the locations within Yakuza are as much a character in these games as the main cast themselves. While it's based on a red light district, Nagasugai is less showy than Kamurocho. Outside of the blinding signposts and flashing advertisements of the central intersection, what comprises this area is mostly utilitarian city blocks populated with businesses, dark alleyways, and parking lots. It's a less pedestrian-friendly layout than other locations in the game. It feels more like a concrete jungle, which makes for some pretty visually uninteresting daytime scenes, but also hammers home the gray, somber state of Kiryu's life at present. There's also a grand total of three save points. What is that shit? Anytime you want to save or use your item box, there's like a 99% chance you're in the least convenient place possible to make it happen. Kiryu needs a skateboard, I've been saying it for years. So Kiryu's boss, Nakajima, invites him out for a night on the town, giving us a little tour of Nagasagai as well as introducing us to Nakajima. He's on the shortlist for most likable character in the entire series. And that's no small feat. <laughs> Opposite to Kiryu, Nakajima's emotions are worn in plain sight. He's extremely good-natured, overly apologetic when he doesn't need to be, and a little too confident when he probably shouldn't be. There's just something about his smiling face that makes me feel like I can trust him. This tour around Nagasugai gives us a glimpse into what the improved engine can do in comparison to Yakuza 4. Namely, the sheer volume of pedestrians walking around. Despite some obviously lower poly counts on their models, I still find this pretty impressive. The implementation isn't perfect, as you can see them popping in a lot but accidentally bowling them over never gets old. These games all have a fairly distinctive look. In RGG Studios' more recent games, they use their Dragon Engine, which gives the games a more stylized appeal. Yakuza 3, 4, 5, and 0 strive for realism. Major character faces are given a more unique look, but many of the characters are built using facial scans. Yeah, realism ages itself, but there's an appealing quality I find hard to explain in these games. It feels like everything is so handcrafted and deliberate. The game relies less on superb lighting, shaders, and model quality to carry it. You can kind of peer under the hood and see how all these different systems work together. Resources are constantly reused in clever ways, and while it's pretty noticeable, I enjoy this insight into the creative process. Nakajima takes Kiryu to a hostess club, a nightclub where women cater to one's every needs and provide them with company. My understanding is that these businesses are quite well established in nightlife districts around Japan, and they're a staple of the series at this point. Here, Nakajima quickly falls for a hostess named Mayumi. Often in Yakuza, you can tell who's going to be a returning character based purely on the amount of detail their face has, or whether they have five-sided heads. And while that's still kind of true throughout this game, the cutscenes in general are pretty well produced. They're a little more grounded in realism than previous games in the series. The face and motion capture look really nice and expressive in these cutscenes without crossing into that uncanny valley territory. Every so often there's somebody who looks like they belong in a siren game. Hold on here, let me just dust off my Regis Philbin impression. Let's play, who wants to win a hundred yet? Okay, I don't think that's gonna work. What do you think will happen in the club? One, Kiryu and Nakajima pay their bills, shake hands, and head home to enjoy the weekend. 2. Kiryu buys several more rounds before blacking out and waking up the next morning on the bank of the Nagasugawa River. 3. Two drunken Yakuza cause a scene. Kiryu intervenes and we're given a fight tutorial. There's no 100 yen. I lied. Now take off your shoes. These guys are gonna kick your ass. This is a pretty rough tutorial. Not that rough, but pretty bad. It had been a little while since I last played a Yakuza game, but I figured I at least had the basics down, but these fellas don't play around. After that confrontation, we're given freedom proper. Now, before I'd played a Yakuza game, I was asked by many people, 
Have you ever played Yakuza? I hear it's like a Japanese Grand Theft Auto. It might seem funny now, but take pity on these folks. Back in the day, there were like two games that all others were compared to. Grand Theft Auto and Zelda, not even a, any particular one. Yakuza's similarities with Grand Theft Auto are sparse. Yes, both games have stories that focus on the criminal underworld and take place in contemporary city settings. Despite the window dressing, the Yakuza games are JRPGs. Trust me here, okay? You explore a map, fight through dungeons, use healing items, gain experience, level up, get into fights with enemy groups, craft weapons, find loot, use special abilities with a limited resource similar to mana. It's a JRPG, and from a mechanical standpoint, it's a pretty traditional one. If this confuses you, all will be explained in good time. The series' latest entry, as of this video's release, uses a turn-based battle system as well as jobs for characters. Some people called this a big change, but it really seemed more like a lateral move to me. The only thing the majority of the series is missing is multiple party members, but hey, Dragon Warrior only has one party member, and that game is like THE JRPG. In general, you're given freedom to explore whatever map your character finds themselves in. A quest marker points towards progress advancing missions, but you're strongly encouraged to slow down and take your time in Yakuza. This game is made up of many constituent parts. Combat systems, mini-games, side quests, all kinds of things that beg to be experienced. So if your plan is to cruise through the main story without smelling the roses, I reckon you're going into Yakuza with the wrong mindset. There are so many things to do in this damn game, you're given a completion list to show everything you've finished. If you go into the game with the goal of ticking off every one of these boxes, well, I don't necessarily think that's the right mindset for Yakuza either. To be clear, everybody plays games differently, and there are always going to be people who really enjoy completion for completion's sake. And if that's you, the Yakuza games will give you a heaping helping of collectibles and challenges to overcome, most of which are pretty high quality. But for the everyman, I found the best way to approach these games is by committing to a leisurely pace. Follow your compulsions, don't rush through the main story, but don't feel obligated to finish every sub-story and activity as soon as they pop up either. If you feel like pursuing the main story, go ahead. If you want to go mess around at the arcade, do it up. If you want to hunt for garbage, you know, um, right on. Oftentimes these side quests, called sub-stories, will fall into your lap simply by engaging in other side activities. I don't usually advocate for a right or wrong way to play games, but I can tell you that approaching Yakuza in this way is what's amounted to the most fun for me. It really feels like a vacation in Japan, only instead of rushing through the week, trying to tick off every landmark, you're there to relax and enjoy the culture. Grab some noodles, beat the shit out of some hosts, go bowling, just take it easy. Of course, everyone in town wants Kiryu dead. They always want him dead, no matter where he is. There's just something about this guy's face that angers society. He's the Dr. Jekyll of Japan, just the number one most hated man by virtue of the fact that he's alive. Imagine walking down the street, seeing someone and just thinking, you know, fuck that guy. That's the Yakuza experience. In Yakuza 5, you can also hit the grind. That's right, Kiryu's a taxi driver and somebody's gotta make the dosh. Taxi driving is largely optional, with only a few introductory missions considered mandatory, and I appreciate that, because it's a pretty major addition to the game. You could say there are three main modes of play in the taxi. You can ferry people around Nagasagai, following the rules of the road and keeping them happy. Then there's Initial D, and then a game where you just try to make conversation with your passenger. Starting with the cabbie game, I don't know how to explain this to you, but being forced to follow the rules of the road is actually really fun. You gotta stop at red lights, use your turn signal, and pedestrians jump in front of you, you gotta come to a full stop without slamming on your brakes so as to upset your passenger. I just find it so peculiar, you're playing a video game, this is a power fantasy, right? This is your one and only time to drive like a maniac with no regard for safety. But being boxed into this narrow set of rules and judged for your performance is actually a ton of fun. A lot of the time you'll be trying to navigate while the passenger wants to chit-chat. You gotta pick the right response while keeping your eyes on the road. It's stressful in a very funny way. It's a relatively simple minigame, but by the end I wish there was more of it. There is a free drive mode around the city, but sadly you run out of this type of mission pretty quickly. Up next in the taxi missions are some arcade-style races. I love the idea, but in practice I found this mode to be a little less fun than the ferrying minigame. Partially that's because I've never played a game like the previous type, it's just so uniquely Yakuza, while the racing game feels a bit underdeveloped. The controls feel kind of touchy, things like drifting never felt quite right to me, and the AI racing you rubber bands like a son of a bitch. 
They'll stay behind you the entire race and then miraculously pick up the pace when it's least convenient. It's not particularly hard. You can use heat moves for these ridiculous theatrical cutaways during the race. They usually automatically place you ahead. Also, finishing races allows you to unlock further upgrades and customization options for your car. Kiryu, for a guy who's trying to lay low, you are driving the loudest fucking taxi this side of the Hakatagawa. With these racing missions in particular, there's an entire sub-story involving an unscrupulous racing group called the Devil Killers. As you play through the missions, you unravel Nakajima's involvement with the group and ultimately repair some fractured relationships while saving the city. It's pretty simple, but it expands on Nakajima's backstory in an amusing way, and watching Kiryu interact with all these stereotypical street racers is quintessential Yakuza. I don't hate the racing game at all, I still think it's pretty fun, and it's a nice way to break up the monotony of safely driving every now and then. It's the taxi conversation minigame I think most people are gonna agree is the least fun. Rather than taking direct control of a cab, you're given a camera angle inside of the vehicle. You encounter all manner of personality types, all with their own problems or quirks, and it's up to you to guide Kiryu through these conversations. It's kind of like having a small collection of sub-stories take place in one location, I can dig it. Primarily my issue with the game is one that I have with much of Yakuza as a series, and that's the conversation options leading to unclear outcomes. Young salesman is considering leaving his job, your options are, if the job doesn't interest you, then leave, you should learn to grin and bear it, or if you want to do something else, then leave. There may have been more of a pronounced difference between options 1 and 3 in the original Japanese, but they're so negligible in English that, uh, let's be honest, it's a total crapshoot. I don't necessarily mind the fact that your success here amounts in part to luck, but they present these conversation choices as sort of a strategic thinking. Like you're supposed to get a read on the passenger and respond in kind. Most of these NPCs are written in a really similar way. Despite some minor frustrations, the taxicab conversation activity did grow on me. I remember the first time I played Yakuza 5, I couldn't be done with that part quickly enough, but as I've become a little older, a little wiser, a little more in tune with the common man. I recognize the value in these small slice-of-life segments. That element of humanity is something Yakuza celebrates unlike any other series, and you're always given these little insights into Kiryu's own way of thinking. Having Kiryu's job be playable was really clever on RGG's part. Definitely adds a lot to this portion of the game without being mandatory. There are entire game systems programmed here, complete with a variety of sub-stories, their own rewards and satisfying conclusions. I like it a lot. It's also a primary way to earn money, as you have to manually deposit your paychecks at an ATM located at corner stores, which just enhances the feeling that you're part of a functioning society. As mentioned, Kiryu's had to step away from his duties at the orphanage, but you're encouraged to send money back via ATM. I just have to ask, why? I deposited so much money, I was just curious to see if there'd be any measurable difference, and there never was. I'm not asking for a tangible reward, but it'd be cool to see how your contributions are improving the orphanage. There's a sub-story where Kiryu sends money to the kids for Christmas gifts, but you don't hear hide nor hair about that. It's literally just there to be a money sink. There's an achievement associated with it, but I'd prefer some kind of in-universe benefit for the kids. That would have been cool. After a long day at work, Kiryu heads home to his apartment to find... Mayumi? You're a woman. She's that hostess Nakajima had a thing for, and she's also Kiryu's girlfriend, sort of. They're in a relationship, but it's more like she's got a thing for him, and Kiryu is going through his Mishima phase, so he has no time for her. She still stays at his place and fawns over him. This distance is at least partially a result of Kiryu assuming a new identity. Even Mayumi thinks he's Taichi Suzuki, although there appears to be a genuine lack of interest on Kiryu's part. It's nice that he's got someone to be a bit open with. Kiryu's kind of in a depressing place. On top of becoming a Weiji, he's between a rock and a hard place. The life he wants to return to is out of his reach, and the life he's left behind hounds him at the door. While at work, he's approached by two Yakuza who know his real name. This is Morinaga. And this old lunkhead who couldn't possibly have any importance to the larger plot is named Aizawa. Morinaga is Aizawa's aniki, a word that translates to older brother. In Yakuza culture, the term aniki is used to describe the relationship between two Yakuza of differing rank, the lower rank referring to the higher ranked as his aniki. Morinaga and Aizawa are in Nagasagai to help facilitate negotiations between Dojima and Madarame. Only after his drive with Kiryu, Dojima mysteriously went missing. We don't know whether it was a kidnapping or a purposeful dropping off the radar. Kiryu hopelessly tries to stay out of this situation. 
In spite of that, Dojima's disappearance clearly has Kiryu stressed as he strangles a pack of darts to death. Kiryu doesn't exactly wear his emotions on his sleeve, so it's cool when you're given some other visual indicator of how he's feeling, usually mad. As Kiryu tries to disassociate himself from the situation, Morinaga and Aizawa decide to rough him up. I'd have mixed feelings about this. On one hand, Kiryu has established himself as a living legend and one of the most unreasonably talented martial artists of all time. On the other hand, Kiryu never kills anyone. He never kills anyone. Under any circumstances. So these guys should live to tell the tale. Let's talk a little bit about combat now. Yakuza uses a real-time combat system with a familiar set of controls. Primarily, you have a light attack, a heavy attack, dodge, a grab, and a block. Pretty standard fare for this type of game, and Yakuza largely adheres to genre conventions. You can string together light and heavy attacks for different combos, you can grab enemies and throw them. It all depends on the tenacity of the enemy you're fighting and what skills you've upgraded through leveling up. Blocking works for a short period of time, but some particularly relentless attacks will break your guard, and that makes you a sitting duck. You can get your ass laid out on the pavement, which breaks up the momentum of combat, but gives you a short period of near invulnerability to find your footing again. You can gain experience and level up, which nets you soul orbs. You can make blocking easier, expand your health bar, unlock some special combos and new heat moves, which are primarily what makes Yakuza distinct from other games of this type. During battles, your character will gain heat from fighting or accidentally pressing the smoke cigarette button in the middle of a fight. Once your heat reaches a certain threshold, you'll be given access to a set of context-sensitive abilities called heat actions, activated by pressing the strong attack button at the right moment. What follows is a brutal, entertaining, and cinematic cutaway sequence in which your character uses some crazy moves to shave off a good chunk of the enemy's health bar. As you play through the game, you'll gain access to more and different heat moves. They get... pretty elaborate. On top of heat moves, you can also equip your character with a variety of weapons. You can come across baseball bats, iron pipes, or find destructible objects in the immediate environment. If you see a bicycle while fighting, waste no time. Your priority is that bicycle. Survival is secondary. As you complete side quests or receive rewards from combat, you'll be given materials that can be crafted into new weapons. That's right, there's Kamiyama, Japan's premier gray market laser sword salesman. You can invest money and items into his shop, which expands his crafting repertoire. But just having access to weapons doesn't make them usable. You also need to train yourself in that particular weapon type. Weapons aren't necessary, but they can make your life easier. In fact, they downright trivialize many boss fights on normal difficulty, which is why I try to keep their use to a minimum. The fact remains, they exist. They've got a whole stack of unique heat actions that can be used as well. You can see how many aspects of this game affect each other. There's always a use for money and materials. Now, the heat actions themselves are something of a double-edged sword. They look great and add this element of brutality to the combat. Sometimes you're just so pissed off after the 30th random encounter as you try to make your way to the nearest save point, that grinding a guy's face into the concrete just scratches some kind of itch. The downside to all of these elaborately animated moves is they often break up the flow of battle. Just something about seeing Kiryu grind the guy's face into concrete for the 180th time does start getting old. Thankfully, you can hold down the left trigger to avoid accidentally using heat moves, but it's a shame that you have to intentionally play less effectively just to avoid the time sink. There are a lot of heat moves that are nice and snappy, in and out, fun to watch with no real roadblock. But in the heat and intensity of battle, it's tough to know what contextual action will come out when you hit that button. Sometimes I'll accidentally use an ability that takes a long time and think, oh damn it, that's not what I wanted. You honestly have time to put the controller down and blow your nose with some of these? This is something the series has improved since 5, to be fair. But while playing this entry, I would sometimes dread unlocking new heat moves, knowing they'd be replacing snappier ones. I suppose one way of looking at it is you're tacitly encouraged to learn and try out a large variety of heat moves to keep things interesting, or otherwise invest in high damage abilities or weapons so you can finish battles without utilizing them. That's probably a pretty generous way of looking at things. I still like Yakuza's combat though. Yakuza 0 wins out for me by giving you the ability to change your fighting style, but Yakuza 5 isn't far behind. In any case, I prefer this era of Yakuza as opposed to the Dragon Engine combat, which trades the deliberate and impactful controls for something a bit more free-flowing and easy to use. Every character in the game has their own fighting style, and Kiryu's is probably the most approachable. Most of the combos are easy to remember, he fares well with groups of enemies thanks to his high reach and finishing kick, the latter of which pierces through enemies and affects the entire lot. 
You can also come across the grandson of Kiryu's old trainer, Komaki, who figures Kiryu's become rusty and offers to retrain him. Once again, there's an entire sub-story associated with these training segments, the rewards from which involve Kiryu relearning some very powerful counter moves, such as the fabled Tiger Drop. For those uninitiated, Tiger Drop is a legendary move in this series, a devastating counterattack that rewards precise timing with ludicrous damage. Some might call it unbalanced. I say, for a game that lets you bring like 40 healing items and a gun to a fist fight, it's just another tool in your belt. Kamaki's training also lets you unlock Red Heat Mode and Dragon Spirit, which prevents Kiryu from being knocked back and gives you a chance to let loose with his fists. Climax Heat moves I found useful in very particular situations, but I do like the principle behind Dragon Mode. Instead of pausing the game to use a heat action, you keep the blood pumping while kicking ass. It offers a utility to heat outside of the actions themselves, which is an addition I appreciate and something I wish the game did more often. All in all, I would describe Yakuza 5's combat as fine. We'll talk about each character's style as they come up, but in a broad sense, it serves its purpose. It never resorts to the overwhelmingly blocking heavy fights of Yakuza 3, nor does it descend into the outright unfairness of Yakuza Kiwami's boss fights. 5 stays in its lane, giving you opportunities to expand your repertoire without ever demanding as much from you, at least on normal mode. If you're playing on EX hard, I hope you brought your Tiger Drop, because that shit's gonna be your only friend from now on. Forge your katana in the fires of Mount Fuji, brother, you're gonna need it. While the boss fights may stress test the game's combat, the vast, vast, vast majority of the time, you'll be facing off against punks, yakuza, hosts, and all manner of dregs who incorrectly decided that winning a fight with a 7 foot tall Easter Island head would be in their wheelhouse. I have a complicated relationship with yakuza's random encounters. I call them that, but you can actually see enemies on the map. Running into them will initiate a fight with mobs. Once again, this game is a JRPG, I'm telling you. At first, potential enemies can be differentiated by spotting this little angry speech bubble above their head. You can avoid conflict by walking past enemies instead of running. That's a bit annoying. The only reason you'd want to avoid a fight is because you're trying to get to your destination quickly. Walking in service of that just feels counterproductive. Although it's pretty funny how they watch you closely, waiting for you to slip up and start running. Why do they even care? They're like hall monitors. Just let me lightly jog across town. I'm a taxi driver. They honestly make navigation a pain in the ass, largely because Yakuza 5's encounter rate seems to be clocked pretty high compared to other entries. The frequency of these guys is sometimes comical. You'll finish one fight, start walking, and enter another one before you've even oriented yourself. It's agony-inducing sometimes. I guess for better and for worse, these trash mobs are pretty easy to deal with. There's no challenge even on harder difficulties. That's good because there's so many of them to deal with. It's nice to have encounters over quickly and painlessly. It's bad because I often felt so disengaged during fights you can get away with button mashing almost every time. Probably would have been better to have a wide variety of combatants, some stronger, some weaker, forcing you to mix up your strategy, but that's never a requirement when it comes to these standard enemies. Eventually, you can find an item called the Encounter Finder, which lets you see enemies on the minimap. I slapped that sucker on Kiryu and never looked back. It doesn't solve your problems with random encounters, but it does alleviate them. Now, the Dragon Engine certainly has its share of problems when it comes to combat, but I do feel a bit spoiled by its seamless battle transitions. Getting in and out of fights is way more expedient in the later games. Anyway, hold on, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, Morinaga and Aizawa, right. They get their teeth kicked in. Kiryu tries to divorce himself from the situation, but as time goes by, he's constantly hounded by reminders, until Morinaga and Aizawa literally arrive at Kiryu's doorstep. Morinaga has been ambushed by Nagusagai's Yamagasa family, seemingly unhappy over the impending alliance with the Tojo clan. Meanwhile, an unscrupulous Tojo chairman named Aoyama has stepped in as acting chairman, quickly supplanting Dojima, even though he's only been missing for a short while. As much as Kiryu may play the part of the retiree, he's fully invested again. The Tojo clan means too much to him, Dojima, in many ways, is like a son to Kiryu. It all means too much to leave behind. On his way to work the following day, Kiryu is approached by one detective, Serizawa, in town on Yakuza business, particularly looking into the disappearance of Dojima. <laughs> As Kiryu plays innocent, Serizawa makes it clear he has no time for shenanigans. In more ways than one, this establishes Serizawa as an officer who plays fast and loose with the rules. 
It seems his ends are moral, stopping a gang war from breaking out, but using shady connections and circumventing checks and balances to do it. He knows who Kiryu is, and he's willing to use him as a pawn in this game. While he never comes right out and blackmails him, it's heavily implied that Kiryu's identity is on the line. Serizawa makes for an interesting wrench in Kiryu's machinery. His voice actor and facial capture is terrific. He really does come across as a hard-boiled cynic who's comfortable exploiting others, although in this case there's mutual gain to be had. It seems Dojima may have been kidnapped by Watase, a captain of the Omi Alliance, and Kiryu's just the man to confront him while he's in town at a hostess club. Speaking of great performances, every moment Watase is on screen is a treat. So, Kiryu Hanmo, dozo. He just has such a great presence, and despite being a bit rough around the edges, he's a likable character. You don't get any sense of uh, hidden intention or unscrupulous behavior. What you see is what you get with Watase. This guy just likes girls, booze, and violence. A refreshingly honest supporting villain after all the sociopaths we have to deal with in these games. He even treats Kiryu with respect as his reputation precedes him at this point. Which might be why everybody seems to know his name. Honest to God, everybody. Every second substory, somebody calls him Kiryu. Grow a mustache, bro, I'm telling you. It's worth mentioning here that Yakuza's cutscenes are choreographed really well. They feel very tangible and very real most of the time. There's three distinct categories of cutscenes in this game. First of all, there's the in-game scenes. These are bare bones, extremely basic, and utilize only a small roster of canned animations to get across characters' thoughts and feelings. Because these are cheap to implement and Yakuza has hours of story, this is where the majority of dialogue takes place. They can be bland when they go on for a long time, as often you're presented with a shot-reverse-shot style of interaction, and the dialogue usually is in voice, which is understandable but still kind of a shame. Every so often they'll play with the angles a bit, which makes things a bit more visually interesting, but characters standing stationarily while delivering line after line is something that bogs the game down until the very end. Fortunately, the second category of cutscene solves most of these issues, with full voice acting, motion capture, and many more complex effects used. These are the cream of the crop as far as I'm concerned, and I'm always excited when I see that fade to black, knowing that one of these scenes is about to play. They're well directed with the great use of music and those in-engine visuals keep things looking crisp. The third type of cutscene is very similar to the second, but these are pre-rendered. The native resolution on these cutscenes appears to be 720p, and they're clocked at 24 FPS, which I suppose some would argue gives them a cinematic feeling, but I don't consider that necessary. I'm not sure why they opted to use pre-rendered scenes for so much of the game. The fidelity offered by pre-rendering is only marginally better than the in-engine cutscenes. It could be these are reserved for scenes where the sheer number of people on screen or lighting effects were too much for the engine to handle, but it's a shame. They so obviously run at a lower resolution in comparison. They still look great though, delivering roughly the same quality of animation of the in-engine scenes. I just wanted to mention that because Yakuza 5 is a very cutscene heavy game. Most of the game's integral moments are established outside of player control, so there's no distraction. Your eyes are always on these characters. Given the sheer volume of scenes, I'd say they did a great job. It's not like they had the financial or technological resources of the Metal Gear series at the time. Yakuza games have relatively small budgets, and they do great work within those limitations, even if some corners do have to be cut. Kiryu gets into a ballroom blitz with Watase's boys because that's just how this game is. These captains and chairmen throw these poor guys into the human wood chipper known as Kiryu. As it turns out, Watase and Aoyama are Kyodai, which is like a brotherhood. Not unlike the title of Aniki, but established between equals. It's a common relationship to see between Yakuza, but what's odd here is that Watase is in the Omi Alliance while Aoyama is in the Tojo clan, two opposing factions. Kiryu suspects that Watase is aiding Aoyama in usurping Dojima's spot, but Watase's true intentions are much simpler. He doesn't care about the underhanded politics, he just craves violence. A gang war would suit his hunger for conflict perfectly. This seems to be a microcosm of the real-life Yakuza situation. As Japanese legislation has been introduced to crack down on violence, these old-school types who prove themselves with blood increasingly find their criminal underworld an inhospitable place for very different reasons. This was true in 2012 when Yakuza 5 was released, and it's true now. The Yakuza find themselves in a situation where their organizations need to pursue legitimacy to survive. 
bureaucracy business working with the modern world instead of operating parallel to it. Watase can't abide by that state of things. He supports those with the highest likelihood of combustion. What did I tell you? Simple guy. Readable guy. He likens his outlook to Kiryu, who he sees as the primary source of Tojo clan strength, but Kiryu ain't having that. どないしましたもう帰りですか勘違いするな俺とお前は違う俺の極道は死に様俺の極道は生き様だどういう意味ですか No! Kiryu is once again approached by Morinaga and Aizawa, who allow you to advance to the next main mission area. Many times throughout Yakuza, you're asked if you'd like to advance. This is a big hint hint, as oftentimes you'll be absent for a long period of time. Sometimes you'll be finishing that character's storyline and moving on to the next character. So, I usually read this as a final opportunity to get everything done. And that's exactly what this is, so join me as I take you on a grand tour of beautiful Nagasugai, Jewel of Fukuoka. So in the most touristy of tourist things, you've got this guy on the board of tourism. He gives you a camera which you can use to snap pictures of landmarks around Nagasugai. The area in which the photograph prompt appears is wide and forgiving enough that you shouldn't have to look it up. You'll stumble across these photo points while cruising the streets of the city. You're given a little side activity in which you can clean up garbage around the city to increase your social ranking. I, in my infinite belligerence, decided I don't like being told what to do, so I bought some bento boxes and started walking around the city, strategically throwing my garbage everywhere. The garbage pickup thing is pretty easy though, you just walk over a shiny spot and press X. There's also Master Chef Tatsuya. That's right, celebrity chef Tatsuya Kawagoe makes it into this game, rendered in weirdly high detail. It's a little odd. Imagine if Jake from State Farm was in NBA 2K22. Tatsuya wants Kiryu to tell him about Nagasugai's finest restaurants, so it's incumbent on the player to visit all of the different restaurants and bring back news of the Orient's finest noodle dishes. In exchange, you're granted some pretty slick abilities from eating food, such as bonus health or strength, urging you to visit all the eateries. All these side activities, garbage cleanup, photographs, restaurants, they're a great non-intrusive way of encouraging player exploration. There's no immediate reason to walk all of the side streets, the eateries, and poke your nose in every corner of the map, but the promise of a reward, however small, is a great encouragement, and it makes you glad you did it. At the very heart of Yakuza is this feeling that you're experiencing a slice of Japanese life. For me, a Canadian, it's almost virtual terrorism. Wait, that's a typo. I meant tourism. Heading into these hole-in-the-wall restaurants with all of these cozy decorations and menu descriptions, I just love it. It feels so laid back in comparison to the crime drama unfolding in the story. A big part of that, as previously touched on, are the sub-stories. Throughout Yakuza, you'll encounter people from all different walks of life experiencing some problem or offering your character a challenge. This friendly-looking fellow takes Kiryu fishing at the sea. It introduces you to a new minigame, and you cap it off by heading back to the restaurant he owns and having a fish fry. There are extrinsic rewards, but often the real joy is just partaking in a fun little adventure outside of the main story. There's another sub-story where Kiryu sees a taxi with its SOS indicator on, so he follows it around town trying to help. Every time he gets close enough, it peels out and heads to a new location, forcing you to keep up the chase. Eventually, Kiryu confronts the driver, who says he threw on the alarm because he was being chased by an angry-looking Yakuza. That's Kiryu, by the way. It's simple, but it's funny and leads to an unexpected outcome, followed by an apology by the way of a little item. Some of the substories contain exclusive minigames that can only be found in that substory, such as this part where an injured noodle shop owner implores Kiryu to help him set up his portable food stand across town. Using the basic framework of the taxi missions, you have to carry this food stand rickshaw to its destination without messing it up too badly. It's pretty fun and the visual image is worth it alone, but in many of these sub-stories there's actually multiple outcomes. 
you can get better or worse rewards depending on how badly you messed up, which is an appreciated touch. They could have given you a simple retry screen for the substory, but instead there are actual consequences for thoughtlessly running red lights and driving incautiously. I also really dig this substory minigame where you have to take noodle orders because the shop owner is injured. Yeah, I noticed there's a lot of things Kiryu's hooped in due to injury, but I don't think about it too much. It's another legitimately fun minigame, totally missable if you don't seek it out, but very addicting, and an example of how Yakuza's substories make each character's section distinctive. To be clear, many of these substories follow a simple outline. Answering questions, getting into a fight, everybody learns something in the end. What keeps these substories from becoming uninteresting is the window dressing applied to them. Whether it's funny, heartwarming, or absurd, simple tasks can be elevated through the use of likable characters and funny responses from Kiryu. Not every substory sticks this landing, there are a fair few that fail to stick out in any interesting way. But these are the exception rather than the rule. And again, there's no obligation to do every substory. Sometimes the best thing you can do is leave these encounters to chance rather than knock them all off like a bullet point list. Most of Kiryu's substories occur as a result of his compulsion to help the downtrodden. Everybody's in big trouble and he can't just turn them down. Well, you as a player can, but you're role playing the wrong Kiryu if you do. After having his fair share of delightful experiences, including stabbing a wrestler to death, Kiryu heads back into the lion's den. We head to Yamagasa headquarters where a meeting is taking place with Aoyama, Kiryu, my man, you could not have picked a louder vehicle to keep a low profile in. Once at HQ, it's up to Kiryu to fight his way to the top and stop Aoyama. This is going to be a familiar sight to anyone who's played a Yakuza game. I consider these areas to be dungeons of a sort. You're basically fighting through an enemy infested area, occasionally challenging mini bosses before reaching the area boss. Sometimes there's slightly branching paths that lead to optional loot, but most of the time it's entirely linear and serves as a gauntlet to, once again, prove that Kiryu is a man of superhuman strength. To be entirely honest, I find most of these areas are a bit miserable to trudge through. The number of enemies you have to fight is ridiculous, and while it's fun to stumble across unique weapons or heat actions, for the most part, you're following through a simple combo, trying to knock them all to the ground over and over again. I could take it or leave it. We confront Aoyama, who stabbed Madarame after the latter tried to shoot him and missed. The reason Madarame tried to shoot him is because Aoyama brought a briefcase with a bomb in it in order to destroy the Yamagasa family. Madarame, being the shrewd old man he is, caught on to this fact. It seems that Aoyama is, in fact, a bad guy. His face does have a very, I'm a bad guy, but not the main bad guy look about it. Ultimately, Morinaga is shot by Aoyama, arranging a scene that frames our boys for Madarame's attempted murder. A ploy that Yahata of the Yamagasa family falls for hook, line, and sinker. If fighting through an army of cannon fodder to get here didn't grab you, maybe fighting through an army of cannon fodder on your way back down will change your mind. It won't. It didn't change my mind. The armchair heat action never gets old, though. Kiryu doesn't kill anyone, he just paralyzes them or sends them into a coma. If there's anywhere weapons are justifiable, it's sections like this. Just grab some big-ass spear and go to town, no shame. I like that there's some depth to the weapon crafting, and it seems a shame to never utilize it, so mowing down the boss's thousand meat shields is a satisfying way to make something of this system. Unfortunately, Kiryu is too late. Aoyama blows the place to smithereens, complicating peace talks to say the least. Back at home, Mayumi tries to make a move on Kiryu, but she should know better. In fact, Kiryu knows that Mayumi is a spy, sent to act the part of his girlfriend while simultaneously keeping tabs on him. She concedes this fact by taking Kiryu to meet her father, Madarame, who's recovering in the hospital. It seems he was told by Dojima himself to keep his guard up should Dojima go missing, a disappearance which was purposely conducted. In the end, Mayumi really did fall in love with Kiryu, and I mean, yeah, of course. Mayumi's spying wasn't necessarily meant to be malevolent, but a result of Madarame and Dojima's agreement to keep Kiryu's identity intact. It's a shame this is the last we see of Mayumi. I was interested in her as a character, and it would have been cool to see more of a dynamic between her and Kiryu. I love old celibate Kiryu as much as the next guy, but I think having an actual love interest would expose a vulnerable side of his character that we rarely get to see. Mixing in a little light betrayal to stir the pot would have made for good character drama. Clearly, that isn't the story they wanted to tell, and fair enough, but as it stands, Mayumi's character is hardly touched upon and she feels more like a narrative device than a human being. 
Madarame decides the best course of action in avoiding war is to dissolve his Yamagasa family, a task he entrusts to Kiryu. He hands him a letter and tells him to bring it to Yahata. There's another dungeon section, and this time they have fire extinguishers. Wait, what? What's in those things? Chlorine gas? Alright, this time, I'm coming prepared. I am going to deliver this goddamn letter if it's the last thing I do. Yahata accepts the contents of the letter with surprisingly little pushback. His allegiance is the Madarame, not the Yamagasa family, and so he respects his decision. But, even without a family backing them up, the boys still want revenge on Aoyama. They arrange a meeting at the docks, some old school gangland warfare, a challenge Aoyama agrees to out of pride alone, even given the possibility of underhanded trickery. A little projection, perhaps. Before heading off to battle, Kiryu decides to come clean to Nakajima, and resigns while speaking vaguely about his dishonesty. Nakajima, certified great guy, tells Kiryu that he's part of the family and doesn't accept his resignation. You know, for a series with a seemingly endless supply of likable characters, standing out at this point requires a certain je ne sais quoi. Nakajima's got it, baby. He's got it in spades. He knew that Suzuki wasn't being straightforward from the get-go. That much can be seen in their numerous interactions, but he trusted Kiryu as a friend and an employee, and he still trusts him afterwards. It's a sort of kindness Kiryu doesn't really understand how to reciprocate. His old employer used the term family too, but it was a different kind of family. The fist fights at Thanksgiving kind. Nakajima's family is more functional. He's the uncle that claps a hand on your shoulder just hard enough that it kinda hurts and offers you a beer unprompted. Loose ends taken care of, it all comes to a head. One thing about these pre-rendered scenes with large groups of people, there's like three or four idle animations and dozens of characters, so it looks like they're coordinating. I don't mind it, I find the limitation kind of charming, just something that I noticed. At the last minute, Kiryu shows up and, you guessed it, decides to take on this army of Tojo clan grunts by himself. If the Yamagasa family lays one finger on them, it's war. But Kiryu? Kiryu is a civilian, so it's fair game to him. I generally dislike these sections where you have to fight like a hundred guys as a boss, but this is narratively appropriate. This is some berserk shit. You feel pretty motivated. It's just so impossibly stupid that one man would come out on top, but Kiryu isn't a man. He's a dragon of Dojima, a legend. And what the fuck? They brought rocket launchers? Can you even... In how, how would you... That... That guy should be on fire. You can tell you're approaching the end of the chapter because the drama intensifies and the number of plot twists per minute ramps up considerably. Aoyama steps in, pointing a gun at Kiryu, as if that's supposed to do anything other than make me chuckle at this point. Aoyama's Kyodai, Watase puts a stop to the battle, having vowed to prevent the gang war, should Kiryu actually win the fight. Which he did. Kiryu beats Aoyama within an inch of his life, which is satisfying as all get out. He's been bottling up this blood rage for months, keeping a lid on his urge to return to his family and watching helplessly as chess pieces move all around him. This is his unabashed return to the Yakuza, and a fittingly explosive ending to contrast the muzzled life we lived in the intro. Before we can enjoy Kiryu's victory, Morinaga appears to shoot Aoyama dead. Hell of a shot, might I add. He cryptically alludes to some collaboration with Aoyama, shooting to stop him from spilling secrets. As Kiryu tries to assail him, Morinaga puts a bullet in Kiryu's leg, informing him that his brother-in-arms, Aizawa, is dead by his own hand, and that all of the answers await him in that little patch of Tokyo we call Kamurocho. Reflecting on Kiryu's section of Yakuza 5 after beating the game, there are some plot twists that require some stretch of the imagination, and of course the action is hyper-realistic in a very silly and theatrical way, but that's just the nature of Yakuza. Seeing Kiryu in the station, doing honest work for a wage, forced to distance himself from his family, it's a miserable set of circumstances that weigh heavily. He's surrounded by reminders of a life he can no longer live. That is, until he does. Maybe Kiryu can't run away from it. Maybe part of him wants it. But the reality is that Kiryu and the Tojo clan are inseparable, symbiotic. As the chapter wraps up, Serizawa tells Kiryu to turn on his radio, as we find out that Goro Majima has been killed. Now, for those who don't know Majima, he and Kiryu are good friends. But, it's complicated. Majima is the yin to Kiryu's yang, where Kiryu plays the straight man, stoic and principled in a predictable way, Majima is pure wild card. The mad dog of Shimano has a storied history with the Tojo clan, taking on numerous different leadership positions within the organization, and pledging loyalty to his good friend and rival, Kiryu-chan! 
He's good fun, and an ally of Kiryu's. Whether or not Kiryu needs any more encouragement, hearing about Majima's death is the straw that breaks the camel's back. He dons his iconic suit, an outfit which, much like the jacket from Drive, is very difficult to pull off if you exist outside of its canon, and leaves for Kamurocho. For now, this concludes our time with Kiryu. It's been said throughout this review, but there are five playable characters, and their individual parts are distinctive. With each new character, your experience, money, and abilities learned reset, wiping the slate clean and starting you fresh. There are benefits and drawbacks to this that I'll mention, but I just wanted to set the stage for our next playable character, Taiga Saijima. If you'd played Yakuza 4 prior to 5, you'll be familiar with Saijima. He's a cool character, but he was kinda done dirty in that game. I guess it's time to talk about rubber bullets, huh? For now, let's head back to Yakuza 4. And these guys here, these guys are nasty, bad, bad people. Sushi showdowns? Sure. This is the actual trailer, by the way. Part 2 of the game begins with a flashback to 1985. We see Majima with his Kyodai, Saijima. Their plan is to knock off 10 members of a rival faction while they meet at a restaurant, knowing full well that prison time or even execution is waiting for them, if they do survive. The day of the assassination arrives. Saijima sits in his car, waiting for Majima to show. He's nowhere to be found, won't answer a call, time is running out. Turns out, there's 18 men, but Saijima is gonna get this done, with or without Majima. He marches towards the restaurant with revolvers in his hand, his waistband, his mouth. Mind you, gun laws are very strict in Japan, so culturally this is all a much bigger deal. Regardless, this is one of the coolest fucking scenes across the entire series. For Saijima, it's one hell of an introduction. There's gravity in this scene, it's so real. No theatrical martial arts showdown, no villain delivering a monologue at the top of the Millennium Tower. Just Saijima snuffing the life out of 18 men without a second thought. Saijima is sent to prison. Here he's given time to reflect and grow. The unmitigated passion of a young Yakuza trying to do his family proud gives way to wisdom. Adrenaline replaced with remorse. And it's all a big lie. Suffice to say, Saijima's guns were loaded with rubber bullets. You see his victims crumple to the ground, they appear to be dead, but it's rubber. All part of an elaborate scheme on the part of an antagonist. Saijima not double-checking his guns before using them is the least stupid part of this twist. Even if they're magical, experimental military bullets that somehow instantly cause the intended victim to fall unconscious, regardless of where the bullet ends up, why is their blood splattered? Why would being shot in the shoulder or belly <laughs> cause you to fall unconscious? If they're going with experimental military tech, wouldn't neurotoxin rounds or something like that make more sense? Now, this plot twist becoming infamous has attracted some of what I like to call rubber bullet apologism. But I'm gonna fall on my sword for this one. Rubber Bullets is dumb, and it's particularly dumb. People will point to the trademark Yakuza ridiculousness or some of the more implausible side stories, but that doesn't fly with me. I think in any Yakuza game, there's a clear line that delineates the story being told and the more abstract video game elements. Is Kiryu actually smoking or on fire when he's in heat mode? No. Has Akiyama actually shot thousands of people? No. Stories, fights, and interesting focal points are represented in outlandish and spectacular ways for the sake of coolness or fun. The Yakuza canon and our experiences in its world are distinct entities, intertwining when the game deems it appropriate. When you're playing a JRPG and you use a spell that literally destroys the entire universe and then it somehow misses the enemy, that's not a failure of the game's consistency. There's a level of voluntary gaminess one accepts when playing a game. In Yakuza, that line is drawn in story-based moments and, in particular, cutscenes. If Kiryu racing his taxi and slamming into cars is presented through a cutscene as a pivotal moment, our suspension of disbelief constricts in order to match its presentation. As a gameplay element, it expands and our standards are relaxed. When described alongside every nutty thing in the series, Rubber Bullets doesn't seem too outlandish, but in context of the presentation, it's a cheap implausibility at absolute best. Does it ruin Saijima's character? 
No, Saejima is still one of my favorite characters in the Yakuza franchise, but anyone saying that it has no effect on his character probably hasn't thought through the identity we form around our actions versus our intentions. Saejima works to overcome the reality of his own character, only to find that that reality was fiction. Maybe there's some potential to explore different themes, the discordance between our motivations and their outcomes, but Yakuza never does that. Rubber Bullets comes across as a sloppily placed plot band-aid, and it damaged the game to which it belongs. If the game can weasel its way out of that, what else is it willing to invalidate? Can I trust what I'm being shown through cutscenes? Of course, it's worth mentioning that everybody has a different level of tolerance when it comes to these things. Explain the CIA twin brother twist to a non-gamer and they'll probably see it as a goofy B-movie twist. Explain rubber bullets and watch them laugh themselves into a coma. If you can suspend your disbelief and hop through the contrivances required to make the twist work in your mind, then that's your prerogative and I couldn't be happier for you. Anyway, that's my piece. I just wanted to establish who Saejima could have been. Now let's talk about who he is. Everybody say lose of love! I love Saejima. Given his appearance, you might expect him to be a bruiser, but he's actually one of the most quiet, thoughtful, and loyal people in the entire series. He's also very frank. When it comes to dropping his opinion, even Kiryu is more tactful. Admittedly, I'm a person of very different sensibilities, so I wasn't a big fan of Saejima's character at first, but he really grew on me across Yakuza 4 and 5. In an increasingly bureaucratic Yakuza underworld where scheming and proxy wars take center stage, Saejima's brutal honesty is refreshing. As of the beginning of Yakuza 5, he's risen to power as a patriarch in the Tojo clan, and he's about to have it all taken away. He sits with Majima in a Yakiniku restaurant. That's barbecue, by the way. If you'd like to learn more about Yakiniku, there's an excellent manga written by Jinji Ito called Greased. It's the story of a family running a barbecue joint together and learning to appreciate the value of togetherness. In an effort to appease law enforcement, Saejima has agreed to serve out the remainder of a prison term he was serving in Yakuza 4. This is a last meal of sorts, just a couple of good old boys eating some tripe. Oh, foul. There's a great little analogy Saejima hints at here. Most meat becomes inedible when it's burned, but tripe just gets better. Saejima has become a big softy, getting a leadership position in the Tojo. In order to inject himself with delicious flavor, he needs the joint to char him up a bit. There's a short-lived opportunity here to explore Kamurocho and Saejima's final hours of freedom, as if the game's saying, don't worry, the city's still here. Not long after, the boys meet for a last hurrah at the batting cages. Except that Majima brings his boys to test Saejima, like, to see if he's ready to go to prison? Why? What will you do if he loses? Force him to not go to prison? So this part acts as a little fighting tutorial, which is appreciated because Saejima plays differently than Kiryu in some pretty fundamental ways. He hits harder, is capable of having a much larger health bar, but the trade-off is that he's slow. I seem to recall finding Saejima's playstyle quite miserable when I played Yakuza 4, and starting out in 5, I had a feeling I wouldn't like him here much either. Over time though, he's become my favorite character to play. Speed is a big part of Yakuza's combat. That responsiveness you feel when you dodge or interrupt a combo is a luxury you realize you've taken for granted when you switch to Saejima. He hits hard, but initially didn't feel as fun to me. That changed as I realized where his strengths lie. Namely, his combos can be finished off with a charge attack, in which you hold down the button and release it at full strength. The key to finding satisfaction here is that it's much harder for Saejima to be interrupted by enemies, especially while charging. You still take damage, but not having your momentum broken by grabs or kicks that make you stumble gives his combat a pleasant flow. He's easy to use and he becomes especially useful when it comes to dispatching large groups of enemies. Like Kiryu, he also comes with an ability that gives heat and auxiliary use, that is, picking up an enemy and swinging them. Nothing game-changing, but once again, I love having alternative uses for heat that don't force you into short cinematics. I would go so far as to say that Saejima is my favorite character to play in this game. Due to his ability to maintain momentum and effectively control crowds, I just enjoyed it. That shockwave ability is one of my favorites. <laughs> With Saejima proven prison ready, he faces his destiny head-on and is sent to Abashiri Prison, off in the snowy wilderness of Hokkaido. 
Thus begins a section I've tentatively titled, Oh my god, when will this be over? This is the worst part, I want to go home, this sucks. So yeah, like Yakuza 4, you get to spend some quality time behind bars as Saejima. In a nutshell, the story of this section involves Saejima and his cellmates being assaulted by a prisoner named Kugihara, who seems hell-bent on breaking Saejima's will and forcing him to retaliate. Saejima, of course, has a vested interest in not spending the rest of his life behind bars, so he's forced to tolerate the abuse. Let's go through the pros and cons of this introductory section. The first is just the principle of going back to prison. As mentioned, Yakuza 4 had a prison section and there is no fun to be had in it at all. It's legitimately one of my considerations when I'm deciding to replay that game or not. When you realize you're headed back to prison, it's like, no, please don't make me do this. Yakuza 5's prison section isn't as viscerally frustrating, but it drags. Despite some fun characters, so much time is spent wandering around the cramped prison yard, exhausting dialogue with random NPCs till you find the one who advances the story. The pace of this is not brisk per se. I'm all for flavor text and world building, but most of the dialogue here does very little in service of that. In order to learn some information, you have to do favors for various characters, and that usually amounts to talking to more NPCs, hoping you find the right one. I'll admit, this chase sequence is pretty fun, but fun in the same way that corn tastes like candy when you fasted for 48 hours. It's just something to do. I suppose on some meta level, you could make an argument that this section succeeds in its purpose. You really do feel like a prisoner who has to serve time. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't really play Yakuza for the realistic simulation. Aesthetically, it's also just boring. I do like that Saejima shaves his head. I think it suits his character a bit better and frames his face in this way that makes him look like a badass Mongolian warrior. The surroundings, though, well, you get tired of snow and brick walls pretty quickly. Gone are the bright lights of Kamurocho. It's almost like you were meant to store up neon energy in that first section. On the upside, Saejima's cellmates are all a pretty likable cast of characters. You've got wizened con man, the goofball, then there's the kid brother of the group, Shigeki Baba. He once belonged to the Hokkaido Yakuza and was sent to prison because he murdered a guy, which makes his body count higher than Saejima's. Baba is a meek individual who takes a shine to Saejima almost immediately, looking at him as an aniki. Saejima similarly develops some fondness for Baba and becomes protective over him, seeing him as a little bro. Their dynamic is enjoyable and gives Saejima something to live for in prison. The meat of the prison plot takes place when Baba is seemingly framed for stabbing another prisoner. He's wheeled off to solitary and it's Saejima's responsibility to find evidence of his innocence. Now, I like this setup a lot. I think there's great potential to turn this into a legitimate mystery plot. Collecting testimonies, finding evidence, putting together the reality of what happened. I don't need an entire minigame around it, but some kind of basic Phoenix Wright style element would have gone a long way to engaging the player. Of course, that's not how it goes. Like everything else that takes place in the prison, the situation is resolved by moving through a linear set of dialogue boxes. It's all so tiresome. Saejima deduces that it was all a setup on Kugihara's part, and that's where he finally loses his cool. <laughs> Saejima is apprehended by Warden Kosaka, another great character in this game. Kosaka is stern as can be. He has a real strong sense of justice when it comes to Yakuza, but he never gets emotional about it. He's not shy about punishing prisoners where he feels it's deserved, but there is some level of sympathy that cuts through his unfeeling exterior, a fact that's made clear as he tries to straighten out Saejima. As it turns out, Saejima has been expelled from the Tojo clan for reasons unknown. A setup? Hostile takeover? Events orchestrated by unknown powers? If I know Yakuza, the answer is all of the above. The Yakuza is all Saejima knows, but Kosaka sees this as a real chance for redemption on Saejima's part. Despite Kosaka's black and white view on these things, for Saejima, it's never been about what side of the law he's on. It's about being around people who have faith in each other. That's why expulsion from the Yakuza doesn't represent an opportunity, but the loss of his family. He becomes despondent and loses his drive, but that depression turns to anger as he reads the news. Goro Majima, his sworn brother, has been murdered. The tiger is about to be let out of his cage. You know, when I wrote that, it sounded a lot less fucking stupid. Kosaka becomes suspicious as Saejima's parole application is denied. It smells like a conspiracy. See, the Yakuza have all kinds of connections, even within the prison system. 
so it's not unreasonable to suspect that somebody wants Saejima to stay there. Especially since in Yakuza 4, somebody also wanted Saejima in prison. Kugihara, it seems, is trying to keep both Baba and Saejima in prison. Kosaka at this point is convinced, so he gives the boys some keys and tells them to escape that night. Given the character he's established to be, he must be very sure of himself to risk the reputation of his prison this way. Heading back to the cell, there's some very weird activity that the boys engage in. No, even weirder than that. They close their eyes and use their imaginations to pretend they're in the nearby town of Tsukimino. And it's just like a playable segment, but in imagination land. I have no idea why this is in the game. I don't care how powerful your mind's eye is, if you're closing your eyes and literally being transported to hostess clubs, you need to be medicated. It's just weird, is it supposed to be a break from the prison? No, I don't want to wander around the spirit world, I want the prison section to be over so I can wander around the normal world. Is it supposed to be an introduction to Tsukimino? Hostess clubs? Karaoke? Why? We haven't needed an introduction to these things any other time, and it's not like they're obscure hidden minigames either, you just go do them if you want to. I don't find it awful or annoying, I'm just baffled that they included this. I tried it, I invited the boys over and asked them to close their eyes, pretending we were at the rodeo together. It was very uncomfortable and nobody answers my calls anymore. Jesus, careful Saejima, if you die in the dream, you die in real life. Later that evening, Saejima and Baba quietly make their escape, as their cellmates apparently predicted. As we reach the prison yard, tons of suspiciously transferred prisoners appear to stop Saejima and Baba. As Kosaka predicted, Kugihara is being given orders from the outside, and he seemingly kills Kosaka. Now, I tend not to panic in these situations. You know how they say, well, if you don't see an on-screen death in, like, The Walking Dead, the character is probably still alive? That's doubly true for Yakuza. In fact, even when you do see someone die on screen, they're probably still alive. Very few characters in Yakuza die without 15 minutes of pomp and circumstance, so I think our boy's gonna be just fine. Predictably, you gotta fight this truckload of inmates, but I actually don't mind. Compared to the absolute hell on earth that was Yakuza 4's prison escape sequence, this is child's play. And as mentioned, Saejima's crowd control is pretty good. Also, because he's the living incarnation of Hachiman, the Shinto god of war, he can lift a 1500 pound industrial drain pipe and swing it around more easily than Kiryu can a stick. Kugihara attempts to stop Saejima, but as you may expect, it doesn't go his way. Alright, the rubber bullets are starting to seem more plausible. Saejima decides he won't kill Kugihara, but break his wrist, and he doesn't just break his wrist, he breaks the shit out of that wrist. Saejima doesn't really show anger, but it's always obvious when he's right pissed because he typically considers something like this to be beneath him. Here he's getting downright righteous in his indignation. He has just had enough. Kugihara pulls a gun on Saejima, but before he can pull the trigger, the boys are saved by Himura, their comedian cellmate from earlier. They stand here and have a heart-to-heart -heart for a good five minutes. Brother, if and when the police arrive, this will not be a good look for you. Maybe we can catch up another time? Honestly, I love how needlessly melodramatic this is. We've already had our unofficial goodbyes, but nope, this is Yakuza, baby. We gotta tie a ribbon on it. At this point, you escape on a snowmobile, and this minigame is actually pretty fun. You cruise through the blizzard trying to avoid obstacles while eventually ramming into pursuers. It's unlike RGG to develop the framework for a minigame and then just use it once or twice. Usually they'll make a bigger deal out of it. Not that I'm complaining. Keeping some of their games to a one and done makes them feel like more of a treat, keeps them from overstaying their welcome, you know? Yeah, I've snowmobiled once or twice in my life, it's a pretty basic technique, you just kinda have to like, shift your weight a bit, just give it a try sometime. Eventually, Saejima loses control of the snowmobile. He and Baba are separated in the blizzard, and Saejima's yelling attracts a demon bear from hell that you have to fist fight. I mean, sometimes there's just nothing to say. Bear is like, all right, you passed the test, you can go to prison now. A hunter named Okudera finds Saejima and brings him back to his cabin, where he lets him regain his strength. As Okudera heads off to hunt, we're given a chance to familiarize ourselves with our new surroundings. Mountain Village is quite different than anything we've seen in the Yakuza series thus far. 
The villagers are insular, trusting neither Saijima nor Okudera. The massive bear dubbed Yama Oroshi by the superstitious villagers has been the product of Okudera's obsession for years. All of Mountain Village believes his obsession is bringing them bad fortune. Mountain Village is small but really cozy. I'm totally sold on the chilly environment thanks to all the blowing snow and some great sound design. Okadera's cabin in particular feels like an oasis. All of this clutter, his hunting gear, the piping hot fire in the center, nothing beats it. Compared to the urban centers of Yakuza 5, there's not a whole lot to do here. You can do some river fishing, which is very simple minigame, but enjoyable nonetheless. There's also a trainer here, this one being slightly more uh, mystical than Komaki. Yeah, you bring the Mountain God offerings and Tendo, styled after Pai Mei, who you might know from Executioners from Shaolin, or Kill Bill, is possessed by his omnipotent spirit. The whole thing is bizarre, straight out of some schlocky old kung fu movie, but I enjoy the vibe. Of course, he's not mystical at all, but an old man trying to scam villagers out of offerings, and watching this story unfold is pretty entertaining. The track that plays during these fights is one of my favorites, and there's just some really creative ideas implemented to make these training battles a bit more interesting than the usual fare. Once you're done kicking pebbles in the village, it's time to get a handle on Yakuza 5's hunting minigame, or as I like to call it, Wildlife Genocide Simulator. Much like how early settlers hunted bison to near extinction, Saijima's bloodlust won't be slaked until every bear, deer, ferret, or rabbit in the Hokkaido prefecture has tasted hot lead. For context, Saijima heads into the mountain and finds Baba. Wanting to repay the villager's kindness, he asks Okudera to teach him some hunting skills, and then it's off to the races. If I had no knowledge of Yakuza 5 and you gave me 12,000 chances to guess what kind of minigames would make the cut, I would not say a hunting simulation. While simulation might be a generous word, it's as much a hunting simulation as Kiryu gets a taxi simulation. At any point, you can opt to head into the mountain with a double-barreled shotgun. There are a host of story and side missions associated with the mountain. The overarching goal is to ultimately find Yama Oroshi. But there are also little treasure hunts and optional collectibles too. The environment is somewhat open, structured similarly to a Monster Hunter game. You've got these small open areas separated with choke points. In each area, there's a chance that some kind of game will appear. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to make sure that no living thing makes it off the mountain. I was gonna do my usual, Actually, in real hunting, you generally want to aim for center mass instead of the head. But with clairvoyance, the game actually says, Shut the fuck up, Magular, just shoot them in the head. It's a simple arcade style hunting game. You collect raw materials from animals, which can be eaten as healing items or sold to make a ton of early game cash. With no regulations, it's pretty easy to turn these humble survival techniques into Saijima Industries, turning into a steady supply of furs and guts for wealth. There are some stumbling blocks that prevent the hunting game from being as good as it could be. The first of all is that Yakuza's limited engine just doesn't allow for that hunting simulation. It's hard to explain because it's kind of an intuitive thing you pick up on after playing these games, but eventually you kind of understand what's possible and it really takes the surprise out of different aspects of the game. You know that setting up traps or retrieving animals is going to result in a text box and a fade to black every time. Yup, there it is. I'm grateful. I love that. Saijima trying to pull the, we only kill because it's necessary, attitude. Give him a golden desert eagle and a cowboy hat, let's just go all in, that's what I say. The other problem is that the game sort of tries to portray this minigame like a survival experience, but they never really go far enough in that direction. Your health steadily drains from the cold, which, in theory, forces you to hunt for meat, or repair these huts on the mountain, but it's not really necessary. Your health depletes so slowly that you can do everything associated with the minigame without ever really investing in those tools. It's also so easy to nab animals that finding meat is never a concern. I appreciate just how different it is from anything we've seen thus far, but it would have been nice if the risk-reward element was more prevalent. I think it would have helped set this minigame apart. It's supposed to be man versus nature, but it mostly just comes across as fuck nature. This lady has her anti-bear strategy down. Assert your dominance by standing perfectly still and not realizing there's a bear phasing through your body. As mentioned, there's a side plot involving Okudera and his rivalry with Yama Oroshi. Like Kiryu's taxi side story, it's an entertaining little ditty, but nothing that knocked my socks off. 
The story becomes more personal as you uncover the truth behind Okudera's identity, but honestly, this is Yakuza. It's gonna take more than a few plot twists to punch into a memorable territory, and I didn't find the story itself particularly compelling. All of that said, I love the difference in tone you experience here. Between Mountain Village and The Hunting, this is some pretty out there stuff for this franchise. There's a sense of relief as you return to the village from a big trip, offloading your gear to the merchant. Also, you fist fight the bear again, except Saijima just knocks it unconscious and they decide it would be unethical to finish it off. These people abide by a strange code of morality. Once Baba's in better shape, you can head down the mountain to Tsukimino, which is the central city of this chapter. Structurally, Tsukimino isn't perfect. Much has been said about its narrow pathways, and I do agree with the sentiment. It's very hard to avoid fights here, harder than any other city, and the semi-invisible don't-go-here walls are, well, a little immersion-breaking, but I guess I just fist-fought a bear, so immersion's not such a concern at this point. I imagine the engine is quite limited in how it can handle vehicle traffic, so you're outright prevented from traveling through any major intersections and roadways. Also, there's police officers on the lookout for Saijima and Baba, but they don't really do anything. They just provide another invisible, no-go zone that you have to skirt around. If the city had more alleyways, back roads, and general freedom for the player, it might have been neat to have a couple cops sniffing around town and playing cat and mouth Saijima. But shoulda, woulda, coulda, I guess. This game is like, what, 10 years old now? Now, there is something about Tsukimino that absolutely elevates the experience, and it can be summed up in one word. Comfy. As many of you know, I value comfy. I wrote a short essay on what it means to be comfy in the context of video games for this very channel. Yakuza 5 is a game that has comfiness in spades, and Tsukimino is a comfiness supernova. As someone who lives in a very cold, snowy city, the atmosphere of this area was so tangible to me. All of the passers-by in their winter clothes. If she tried that where I lived, she would develop gangrene and die. The city lights, the snow falling gently, all of these side roads that just beg to be walked down at nighttime, it's so atmospheric. I also like the sculptures in the northern part of town, which is a criminally underutilized section. Yakuza 5 also has the rare distinction of being a Christmas game. Japan doesn't celebrate Christmas in the same way as the Western world, which might explain why all of the holiday stuff isn't more front and center, but in the winter wonderland of Tsukimino, it becomes clear. It just couldn't be any more comfy. So despite people's misgivings with the limiting map, I still really enjoyed my time in Tsukimino. One of the most important things in a Yakuza game for me is that feeling of just walking around a foreign environment, feeling like the world is your oyster, and the city nails that. That is until you remember that we are wanted fugitives and are also accosted on every street corner. Saijima's sub-stories kind of make him look like an idiot. In a good way. There's this one where you've got to navigate an icy patch of road carrying piping hot ramen to a customer who refuses to walk the requisite 25 feet he would need to acquire it himself. I'm noticing a lot of sub-stories have to do with personal injury and noodles. There's also this girl who's so taken with Saijima's description of deer stew that she wanders into the wilderness and almost dies in pursuit of a deer. What were you planning on doing when you found one? Killing it with your bare hands? There's also more than one opportunity to dress Saijima in a Santa suit, which I thought would make him look jolly, but it more just makes him resemble a horror movie villain you might find on, like, Tubi. Also, a lot of these NPCs look they look like children with sharpied on beards trying to look old enough to get into an R-rated movie. You can really see the difference when you put their heads next to somebody like Tatsuya, who's also here, by the way. There are some reoccurring characters such as him or the photography guy that give you a chance to do the same minigames in multiple cities. In a country as big as Japan, I'd say it's quite the cosmic coincidence that these people end up in the same place as our protagonists. There's this wicked snowball FPS minigame that kind of sucks. I thought it'd become a god among men by using my mouse, but it's not really that kind of an FPS. Snowballs hone in on targets as long as you're roughly aiming for them. Another hardcore franchise casualized by the console market, what a damn shame. Even though the snowball fights are pretty simple, it's just another example of this game's absurd level of variety. They didn't need to include this. I'm sure it didn't tilt review scores one way or the other, but hey, it's there. Sometimes after a long day of beating the shit out of 1930s mafiosos, a snowball fight is just what the doctor ordered. Doctor? Doc Brown. Segway. On the topic of unremarkable minigames, there's also this character, Minamata. He's got a virtual reality game he wants our main characters to test. It's sort of like a bad version of Double Dragon with Yakuza flavor. 
That's honestly talking it up a bit too much. Less double drake and more bad dudes. You just fight till the end of a stage. It's too easy to knock enemies off screen and you have to sit there and wait for them to stand up and come back. Distinctly unenjoyable, but you do get an extended heat bar out of the deal, so it's probably worth putting up with. As for the story in the Tsukimino section, it's a flash in the pan. Saijima and Baba set up shop in an abandoned bar where they plan their next move. There's a series of fetchy type quests you have to deal with in order to find information. The patriarch of the Kitakata family, Kitakata, is making an appearance at the upcoming festival. In order to get some information on Majima's death, Baba and Saijima decide to kidnap him. Interesting, I like the setup. They're already fugitives from the law. How do they plan on executing a kidnapping and how will they deal with the repercussions? I just gotta know. On the day of the festival, they wait until an air show draws attention upward and pull him through a sewer grate. No, no, no. Rewind the tapes. I want to see it. I want to see a six foot five hulking Yakuza in cargo pants and a parka stand in front of hundreds of people, including snipers literally stationed on rooftops, and pull this heavy set man into the sewers without ever having been seen by a single person. You, as the observer, would have to make a Herculean effort to not notice this occurring. And yet, somehow, nobody did. I can't think of anything that would make this make sense. Oh, but I'm sure someone's gonna defend it. Oh, he, he wanted to go into the sewers, Magilar, so he just slipped in when he saw them. Okay, so? So? That doesn't suddenly make him invisible. If you saw these two fucking guys peeking out of a sewer grate in the middle of some wacky caper, even if you absolutely did want to join them, you'd probably have some kind of startle reflex or reaction. You might say something along the lines of, hey, these guys from the sewer are pulling me into the sewer, someone help. Even if he waited until everyone was looking up and quickly ran into the sewers like voluntarily without anybody pulling him in or anything. There's still not a chance that like at least half the people there wouldn't notice this guy standing up and opening a sewer crate and climbing into the sewers. Are we just giving up on trying to make things even remotely believable in Yakuza's world at this point? Is that it? I'm seething right now. I want answers. They don't even have to be good answers, but you gotta give me something. Is this like the annual Hokkaido Festival for the Blind? Is it like a Japanese Christmas tradition to see a jolly man in the sewers and quickly jump in after him? I'm begging you here. Somebody please help me. Well, clearly he doesn't go willingly. Saijima's arm is around his neck. I guess somehow he appeared behind him while seated too. I'm... I'm trying to let this go, okay? The game keeps roping me back in. Kitakata escorts the boys through the sewers to an abandoned building where they can talk more comfortably. Wait, um? Um? Why um? Baba, where are you going? They never include um in the dialogue unless the character is lying through their teeth. Kitakata manages to explain that he wasn't involved with Majima's death when suddenly he's assassinated. The assailant, it's Baba by the way, it's visually clearly Baba, nobody else wears that George Costanza Gore-Tex jacket. You know, I'm never really clear on whether I'm supposed to know the truth or not. I, I know what's about to happen. Saijima runs downstairs and there's a chase sequence, we unmask Baba. Saijima is surprised, but am I supposed to be surprised? Anyway, Saijima runs downstairs, there's a chase sequence and we unmask Baba. Baba. We're all shocked, but how did this happen? Baba was never in the Tsukimino Yakuza. It was all a ploy. He was sent to prison in order to keep tabs on Saijima, to guide him into this exact position, but he's conflicted. His borderline psychopathic actions aren't exactly cogent with this soft-hearted regret at this point. It comes across as a bit of a ham-fisted revelation. But, as a device to break Saijima out of his straight-faced malaise, it works. We're not allowed to know whose employ he's under, so Saijima has to die. There are many plans in the Yakuza series hatched by villains where an absurd number of steps need to go off perfectly without a hitch, and this is no exception. Did Baba know that Saijima would fistfight the bear? At this point, anything is possible. The important thing is that our Baba-chan has a change of heart. He can't point a gun at his Aniki, or his Kyodai. Nuts to tradition, so says Saijima, we're brothers no matter what. Overwhelmed by emotion, a vulnerable Baba points the gun at himself, but Saijima snaps into action, showing some emotion for the first time in this act. He can't bear the thought of Baba offing himself, so he decides to kick his ass. 
一変死ぬほどの恐怖をその体に叩き込んだるわ If you thought this would end any other way, I question your experience with this series. As monumentally corny as this entire part of the story is, I really do dig Bob as boss fight. He's got a different style than most bosses. Lots of quick footwork and almost like a boxing stance. It's the kind of sneaky assassin style martial arts that fit his character really well in light of recent development. Also, the music during this fight just slaps, brings all kinds of energy to the battle. Ultimately, Baba gets some sense beat into him. He resolves to live until he achieves his dream. Oh, yeah, dreams. That's the central theme of Yakuza 5, and this game will never stop letting you know. It's a very broad theme, down to interpretation in some cases, but shoved in your face most of the time. Very shonen anime, starts out subtle, borders on self parody by the end. I think it's at least in part because it's hard to say something meaningful about a theme as ambiguous as dreams. It's honestly something that could be shoehorned into pretty much all of the other Yakuza games in some capacity. There's more to say about it throughout the game, but for now, it is, in no uncertain terms, the theme of Yakuza 5. Baba shuffles off, and Saijima is arrested by Serizawa. He reveals to Saijima that the Tojo clan itself offed Majima, while also dropping some Chapter 1 related exposition. There's no doubt about it, a traitor walks in the Tojo's midst, thought to be Morinaga by Serizawa. The two men strike an agreement. Saijima will be released, but he's gotta head back to Kamurocho, where shit will inevitably go down. That's Saijima's chapter over and done with. What's clear to me is that, compared to Kiryu's section, Saijima's is more of a mixed bag. The first section had the benefit of more clearly setting up the overarching storyline while introducing us to new characters. The second section has to get its hands dirty, furthering this conspiracy storyline while also rushing past three distinct areas with their own stories and characters. It's too messy to ever marinate in the same intrigue as section one, and boy does that prison section suck major ass, but it's hardly irredeemable. The mountain village section, complete with its own set of unique mini games and stories, is so wildly different from anything else in the series, it almost defines Yakuza 5 due to contrast alone. Tsukimino, while it has its own problems, is such a comfy hub area. In sheer personality, it runs circles around Nagasugai. With some improvements, it would almost stand toe to toe with Kamurocho, but it does drop the ball as far as design goes. Now, as different as the second section has been, it doesn't hold a candle to the uniqueness of the third section. We're given a flashback to the orphanage. You can tell what time period it is because Kiryu has that same keen fashion sense he had back in Yakuza 3. Enter Park, a character whose likability index is hard to explain but generally quite low. Remember how I mentioned Haruka is working to become an idol? Park is her manager, and she is outwardly one of the coldest characters in the entire series. This introduction where she chastises Kiryu makes me want to step in and protect him. <laughs> How dare you speak to my son this way? Despite her harshness, Park is an excellent businesswoman, and her belief in Haruka's talent comes from a place of sincerity. As previously stated, having a Yakuza father in this industry is not a good look. Kiryu believes he owes it to Haruka to make her dreams come true. It's tough to see Kiryu in this situation. He usually has a snappy comeback, some self assured response, but as Park undresses him emotionally, he's got nothing. He's got to do something he really, really doesn't want to do for someone he loves. And that's leave their life indefinitely. Cut to the present day. Haruka is practicing. An idol's got to have it all singing, dancing, charisma. There's no one area they can really afford to relax in, so these training sessions are suitably relentless. The dancing instructor, Ogita, is a dick. He has a dick face, you can just tell. Haruka doesn't give up though. She knows how much Kiryu has sacrificed to get her there. She can't afford to let him down now. And that means a dancing minigame. That's right, as much as I was looking forward to watching Haruka curb stomp Yakuza and break their spines with bicycles, there's no traditional combat in her section. The director placement for this is her dancing. Now, listen very carefully to this song. You are going to hear this song. 
so many fucking times throughout the game that the introductory notes are going to make you scream. Anyway, back to the minigame. It's fairly straightforward. You just time notes with the appropriate button presses. You start with an allotment of heat and use it to boost your points throughout the song. It's fine. The rhythm game is very straightforward and never deviates too much from what you see here. Generally, I wish there was an option to make it harder. The dancing never once stress tested me. I could honestly do pretty well even if it was muted, which is too bad. I understand why the difficulty has to be manageable. Some people are just bad at rhythm games. Some people are actually deaf or hard of hearing. I wish that difficulty setting made a difference though. It doesn't really seem to do anything. We're introduced to the employees of Dyna Chair, which is the name of Haruka's agency. Of course, there's Park and Ogita, both unpleasant people, both at each other's necks for various reasons. Standing totally opposite to this is Horie, who's a lovable dork, friendly and naive. He genuinely wants what's best for everybody and avoids conflict where possible, and at present, he's the only one who really shows any love to Haruka at the agency. There's also Haruka's vocal coach, Yamara, but currently she doesn't receive much screen time. As far as where Haruka's section takes place, it's all in the Osaka district of Sotenbori, based on a real-life city called Dotenbori. That's like if I took the name Steven Spielberg and called him Steven Gielberg. Like, that's not funny. Sotenbori will be familiar to anyone who's played Yakuza 2 or Yakuza 0. It features prominently in both. The area is much easier to navigate than either of the previous sections. The entire area is made for pedestrian foot traffic, so there's few narrow sections or invisible walls, but rather a self-contained piece of city, much like Kamurocho. I like the river running through the center of the city. It's kind of like a dividing line between the entertainment and business district as well as a residential area. It gives Sotenbori two distinctive flavors. And bridges are just cool, you know? We love bridges. This is a bridge-friendly channel. My attitude is also improved by the fact that Haruka isn't assaulted by angry hosts every few feet. In fact, the only battles she has are dance battles, which aren't compulsory for the most part. It's honestly a breath of fresh air. Just when some of these conventions are starting to wear on you, Haruka's section is perfectly placed in the middle, gives you some time to relax and regain your desire to kill. You might think the story of an up-and-coming idol will pale in comparison to the national Yakuza conspiracy plot we've been unfurling, and in fact, you'd be wrong, at least in my opinion. Haruka's story is engaging for distinctly different reasons than anything we've seen thus far. She's a fish out of water, coming from her small community in Okinawa and having to play the part of idol in this big city. She struggles to make friends, she feels isolated and homesick, she's a victim of bullying, all while contending with a lifestyle so fast-paced that a warm breeze on the beaches of Okinawa feels like a distant dream. It all starts at Dyna Chair, where many story-based missions take place, as well as Haruka's side story. She doesn't get one major identifiable minigame, but rather a collection of smaller minigames joined together. You can select a job from the menu at Dyna Chair and engage in any number of television appearances, live performances, or meet and greet events. The handshaking minigame gets old pretty fast. You have to press the handshake button and color match the various responses so as to not piss off the fans, but watch out, a security guard slowly approaches to send the fans packing. It's just a matter of timing your handshake release and selecting the right response. It'd probably be easy for you. I'm colorblind, so it was a bit of a pain in the ass. If you encounter a Haruka stand, you pretty much pass the minigame right there. There's absolutely no variation in this particular minigame, and yet, if you plan on finishing Haruka's side story, you'll be shaking many a hand. There are television interviews, pop quizzes, and various minigames to perform on TV. Similarly to sub-stories, it's largely a matter of selecting the right response or doing well to maximize your reward. In this side story, and also on the street, you'll encounter others who can face you in a dance battle. There's a small added layer of depth compared to concerts, but nothing to write home about. As Haruka levels up, you'll gain different abilities that can be used to lower opponents' health, increase your score, etc. I never found it necessary to strategize. As long as you aren't screwing up egregiously, you'll do fine. At best, these abilities just end the dance battle sooner. Most of Haruka's side story activities are simplistic and become repetitive, which, to be fair, accurately represents the nightmare one must go through to become a famous pop star. In small doses, they mix things up in enjoyable ways, but don't expect an entire game's worth of new content out of this. You won't find the same level of depth in dancing that you'll find in combat. They're stretching things out a little bit. But you know what they say, practice makes perfect. The crux of Haruka's plot involves her competing on a Japanese game show called Princess League, which, like American Idol, awards the winner with a record deal. Horie and Haruka decide to pay a visit to Princess League headquarters, maybe shake a few hands and make some connections. 
This is where we're first introduced to T-Set, a competing act comprised of two girls about Haruka's age and her primary antagonists. <laughs> These girls are mean. When boys bully, they kick each other in the dick and then ask if you want to come over and play time splitters after school. When girls bully, they find and exploit your emotional vulnerabilities until you're a walking husk. It doesn't help that Haruka is a particularly cheerful specimen, making her easy prey. I'd hesitate to call her naive though, Haruka has arguably been through more trauma than any of the other characters in this series. She's capable of great harm, but chooses the path of light. The girls exploit this, tripping Haruka and making her spill coffee all over Manda, Princess League's producer. Get a load of this prep outfit. Oh, you've spilled piping hot beverage all over my newest Dolce Camilla. I'm due half past Farquaad at the tennis pitch. Now I've got to take my 1995 BMW 3 Series to the dry cleaner. Dreadful state of affairs, simply dreadful. It's a pretty lousy first impression, one that stacks the odds ever more against Haruka. As Horie scolds T-Set, we meet their manager, Nakai. He's another unpleasant figure, one who's comfortable stooping to new lows to discourage Haruka. As it turns out, T-Set used to be signed with Dynachair, but for various reasons, moved to a new agency called Osaka Talent. A woman named Yoko arrives to mentor Haruka and ZAM! Straight out of the far side school of fashion excellence. Yoko acts as Haruka's trainer, living under a bridge and demanding an investment of deep fried street food in exchange for beauty tips. They don't really do anything interesting with this, it basically acts as a series of fetch quests in exchange for bonuses that make dancing even easier. She does give Haruka a quick change outfit, which, uh, well, it's a thing, all right. Hey, son, the big game is on. Me and your mom were wondering if you wanted to grab a beer and... The Princess League cinematics are pretty entertaining. It's a real showdown, and the show's host, Dolce Kamiya, is like a marginally less punchable Japanese Ryan Seacrest. Given the consequences for cocaine use in Japan, I have to assume all of his manic energy is natural. He's just high on life. In the end, Haruka pulls ahead of T-Set and wins round one of Princess League, as if there were any doubt. There are plenty of opportunities to explore the city of Sotenbori, and as mentioned, there's a distinctly pleasant feeling of not being attacked every 12 feet. Her substories are tied in closely with her work at Dynachair. Many are triggered by her being recognized on the street or having to conduct television interviews. It often portrays a girl in way over her head. She hasn't developed those mental calluses needed to take fame in stride. There's still a novelty to the whole thing, but also a deep sense of uncertainty. More than once, the game alludes to the sexual impropriety of men in the industry. At one point, T-Set's Azusa puts aside her rivalry to help her deal with the creepy manager. As a brief aside, Azusa seems like a decent person as long as Mai isn't around, which is a fairly accurate depiction of bullying. There are paparazzi swarming Haruka, trying to take creep shots. That substory involves you just trying to spot them within a certain time limit. Aside from that, it's mostly snapshots of Haruka trying to find normalcy in her new life. There's no break from her work, it's all just relentless. Back at home base, Haruka overhears an argument between Park and Ogita. Park fires Ogita without payment, using a loophole she created in his contract. He doesn't like that much, so he throws her to the ground, and I've probably been playing this game a little too much, because I sure as hell thought he was about to follow it up with one of these. We find ourselves a new dance instructor named and This one's a bit softer around the edges. And Ogita, he leaves this place, never to return. At certain points throughout the story, T-Set's bullying of Haruka intensifies. It makes me feel angry, and if Kiryu were here, he'd snap their necks, but we're just forced to watch helplessly. That is, until Park comes to Haruka's aid. As shrewd and unlikable as Park has come off so far, seeing her interacting more with Haruka does bring about a change of heart filling a role that the two of them desperately need in their lives. And it's heartwarming. It's nice to see something good happening to Haruka, and their relationship comes across as genuine, even if Park's sudden shift in disposition is a bit hard to believe. Park takes Haruka for a night on the town. First, there's shopping. I bought a pink blouse, a gray skirt, a pair of kissy boots. 
I'm colorblind, that's my excuse. Next you head to the arcade where you get your photos taken and play Taiko no Tatsujin, which is another rhythm game. I haven't really mentioned yet that Yakuza games have a storied tradition of including Sega brand arcades in their games. In Yakuza 5 you can play Virtua Fighter, Taiko no Tatsujin, and an original game called Gunnerhine, which is pretty challenging but enjoyable. Just a little postscript, Gunnerhine doesn't seem to be available on the Steam version, at least I couldn't get it to work, so I've seized the opportunity to try out the new capture card. Thank you, Patreon donors, and uh, I guess enjoy this PS4 footage instead. On the ride home, Park reveals a letter she's received from her estranged lover of years past. He's asked her to meet in Tokyo the day of a theoretical concert they've been planning for Haruka at the illustrious Japan Dome. Worried about having visibly aged since their last meeting, Park asks Haruka if she'll meet him in her stead and bring him to her, presumably in a location with flattering lighting, like a bathroom. Everybody looks sexy in the bathroom mirror, even me. She gives Haruka a special fountain pen to prove their connection. This conversation completes Park's transformation from cold, calculating businesswoman into a sympathetic character. We find out the reasons she got into the pop idol business, namely, she once had a real opportunity to become an idol herself. It was her dream to perform in the Japan Dome, but due to a secret marriage and an unplanned pregnancy with her aforementioned lover, her future was cast into uncertainty. Without consulting him, she had an abortion, which caused her husband to assault and leave her in anger. Ultimately, her agency caught wind of this and her career was over. This context frames her attitude in a believable way. Her seemingly impenetrable emotional barrier isn't just the personality of a cutthroat businesswoman, it's a defense mechanism. Haruka is her dream surrogate, her last chance to vicariously live out the life she could have had. She can't afford niceties, everything is riding on this. Nonetheless, in Haruka, she sees a daughter, another possible future that she once eliminated in service of her dream, and this breaks those walls down. She gives herself room for vulnerability at once seeing the role that positive affirmation has on Haruka and also enjoying a little slice of motherly love for herself. Things are looking up for Haruka, I couldn't be happier for her. The next day, Park jumps from the roof of Dinachair and dies. <sighs> Can't we just let Haruka have a thing? Yeah, it's pretty heartbreaking for her, but we don't really have time to sit with this because the next section of game begins already. Akiyama's segment of the game is a bit weird in that he shares his time with Haruka. Akiyama has arrived in Sotenbori, the context of which being the opening of a new Sky Finance facility in Osaka. What are the odds? Let's talk about Akiyama a bit. When Yakuza 4 opened up, I was surprised to see I wasn't playing as Kiryu but Shun Akiyama. I think that says a lot about RGG's confidence in his likability, and it's a confidence that's well placed. Out of the gate, Akiyama is on the shortlist for Yakuza's most charismatic individual. He's laid back, hands in his pockets, smoking cigarettes when it's most cool, and generally takes an easygoing approach to problem solving. But beneath the exterior, there's a streak of eccentricity that runs through Akiyama. He's pretty goofy and more than a little lazy, which mostly just helps him feel relatable. One of the strangest parts of Akiyama is his business model, which is basically not-for-profit money lending. His backstory is one of highs and lows, but suffice to say, back in 2005 he was homeless. Through a stroke of sheer luck, he becomes extremely wealthy, a hundred billion yen wealthy. That's like a thousand dollars. He decides to open up Sky Finance, a money lending service for those with nowhere else to go. He offers zero interest loans depending on the circumstance, but there's a catch. You have to pass his tests. For Akiyama, this is, you might say, fuck you money. He's got more than he'll ever reasonably need and he has no problem giving it away. But first, he'll make sure your heart's in the right place, and you have the tenacity to do what needs to be done. There are a number of interpretations you could apply to the test, but at the very least, they act as a measurement of character, making sure he's lending to the type of person who will do the right thing with the money and also have the integrity to hopefully pay him back. Anyway, money lenders don't really like Akiyama. He throws a wrench in their business model, which is clear in his introduction. Some loan shark goons show up to chase him off and we're forced into a fight. Akiyama's fighting style is very different from either Kiryu or Saijima, and it's thanks to his fast-moving acrobatic style. There's a focus on fancy footwork here, as Akiyama almost exclusively uses his legs to deliver punishment in fights. It's easy to deliver multi-hit combos by repeatedly pressing the attack button, and some of these heat moves are just brutal. I remember loving Akiyama in Yakuza 4, I think he was my favorite character to play, but there's something about his style in 5 that doesn't quite achieve the same effect. First of all, his crowd control ability is pretty terrible. It feels really easy to be interrupted by others, and that's partially because his combos last a very long time. 
My other problem with Akiyama is that most of his kicks lack impact. It's very difficult to break through an enemy's guard with basic attacks, which leads me to rely on heat actions and weapons more than usual. In general, his style improves over time, but it still didn't grow on me the way Saijima's did. There is one huge bonus to Akiyama's combat, and that's his aerial abilities. He can lift an enemy into the air with his kicks and deliver these ridiculous mid-air combos, limited only by the capacity of your heat bar. Of all the auxiliary uses for heat, this one is probably my favorite. It feels natural, sometimes so natural you'll accidentally use it in a fight, but it doesn't really matter. You can flow in and out of it pretty easily. It's a perfect fit for Akiyama. Mind you, most larger enemies and bosses can't be launched, but it's a quick and satisfying way to dispatch the average street goon. So we find Akiyama's in a bad position. He lent an exorbitant sum of money to Park for her Japan Dome reservation, and Park can't exactly pay him back anymore. He visits Dyna Chair, where he's surprised to find Haruka, his good friend's daughter, sitting alone. As it turns out, everybody at Dyna Chair suspects foul play. Akiyama decides to do some investigating, and after she begs for a while, relents and agrees to let Haruka help. Now, I'll say this. The structure of this chapter had a lot of potential. Up until this point, Akiyama and Haruka have had little interaction in the series, maybe even none? So seeing their dynamic is pretty entertaining. For Haruka, Akiyama is like a distant uncle, and while Akiyama doesn't really know how to talk to kids or teens, he tries his best. Having to swap between these two characters, collecting clues, and actively working to solve a murder mystery would have been extremely charming. In reality, it doesn't really play out that way. Like collecting evidence in the penitentiary, we're mostly just moving through a linear sequence of mission objectives. You can swap between characters, which is kinda nice, but unless you're just finishing up sub-stories as Haruka, there's not really much of a point. Akiyama is who you'll play as for the majority of this section. As a result of splitting this section's difference with Haruka, everything surrounding Akiyama feels a bit half-baked. His sub-stories are far and away the simplest of the lot, generally involving basic dialogue choices, fighting goons, or even having a Haruka-style dance battle, which I guess has some entertainment value. Not only are his sub-stories less interesting, but he doesn't even have his own side story. Kiryu had taxi driving, Saijima had hunting, and Haruka has Dyna chair work, but Akiyama gets nothing. Now, maybe I'm just being a spoiled brat, maybe it's unreasonable to expect another full-fledged minigame for this section. But it makes Akiyama's chapter feel distinctly undercooked when compared to the other characters. Narratively, he almost doesn't need to be directly involved, he could have been relegated to NPC status. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad we have a chance to play as him, but his inclusion feels shoehorned. I think there was a great opportunity to cut down the volume of sub-stories in exchange for some dual sub-stories. Getting both Akiyama and Haruka involved would be cool. It makes sense, you can switch between characters freely anyway, and it would lend to the sense that the actions of one affect the other, but the game never seizes on that. Like the others, he does get his own training section. Military man and doomsday prepper Saigo makes his return in this game putting you through some truly hair-tearingly awful boot camp training in exchange for improved abilities. The Yakuza series just doesn't really know how to handle firearms. Also, the idea that these guys are just shooting Akiyama in the streets of Sotenbori is hilarious to me. I know it's supposed to be like airsoft guns or something, but still, imagine looking at your bedroom window and seeing this madness. You can also collect keys to open coin lockers. It's nothing too special, we've seen it before, but just another little encouragement to explore. As Akiyama investigates, Horie is thrown from the roof of Dynachair. He apprehends the serial shover Ogita. Speaking of interesting fighting styles, this guy seems very inspired by Eddie. This fight is kind of a pain in the ass. Like Baba, Ogita's got all kinds of grabs up his sleeve, but it takes place so early in Akiyama's section that you'll have a tiny health bar and no real abilities yet. This one feels particularly satisfying. After beating him into submission, Akiyama is approached by a literal ogre. No, Haruka, if you want to kill a man with a fire extinguisher, there's an easier way. Back to back boss fights. This one is pretty annoying as well and perfectly exemplifies my problem with Akiyama's attacks being blocked. Often it feels like they're not even tickling the opponents. The perpetrators take off, promising to remember Akiyama, who rushes Horie to the hospital. The plot thickens, and not necessarily in a bad way either. The entire story still feels relatively standalone. There's no messy webs of conspiracy outside of a genuinely decent murder mystery. That will change, but for now, I'm enjoying it. Akiyama manages to track down a forger, believing Park's Sudoku note to be fake, sorry, demonetization is a bitch, 
Actually, it's Haruka that brings up forgery. You know this 16 year old has been through some shit when she's working her way through murder suspects faster than Akiyama. This also proves that she's not useless, not at all. She's a big help in the investigation. It really does feel like teamwork rather than babysitting. I appreciate that Haruka is written to be sweet, but not naive. There's no way she could be at this point. So yeah, Akiyama finds the forger. He says he doesn't know much, but then proceeds to tell us that he recognized the guy who asked for the note as a driver for the man named Naoki Katsuya who runs the company Osaka Talent. Holy shit dude, steel trap memory. Ask me what I had for lunch yesterday and I need 15 minutes of complete silence while I retrace my steps. It seems that this Katsuya fellow is the one who ordered Park's assassination. Akiyama decides to shoulder that burden while Haruka prepares for the next round of Princess League. Akiyama arrives in the office of Osaka Talent's president Katsuya. There's a tense formality in the air during this meeting as they both know why Akiyama's here. Katsuya was once an actor who then, similarly to Park, retired from the spotlight in order to run things behind the scenes. Whether or not he was a good actor, his eyes betray nothing during this conversation. Whether he's playing dumb or really is confused about the situation, it's hard to tell. Akiyama boldly calls his bluff, resulting in the president writing him a sizable check without ever admitting to any crime. He just wants to be disassociated from this situation. But if there's one thing we know about Akiyama, it's that money doesn't mean much to him. Meanwhile, Dynachair's management has been taken over by Haruka's vocal coach, Yamaura, an employee of Parks who hasn't had much screen time. Just as much as everybody else, she's in over her head. Parks' business acumen was one of a kind, and there's a lot of work to handle. There's also a song that isn't so much more, and although it doesn't quite have the same happy-go-lucky energy, Whatever, man, I'll take a Bon Jovi rock ballad at this point. Haruka, in a moment of weakness, has agreed to join Osaka Talent if she loses the Princess League. However, if she wins, Nakai has to stop being mean. Not sure if the risk-reward pays off on this one, but who am I to judge? Of course, Haruka kills it. Her victory speech is appropriately candid and humble, given the Haruka that we all know and love. T-Set has the idle chicanery down to a science, delivering boilerplate speeches when prompted, but Haruka can't help but be honest. As they leave with a renewed sense of confidence, Haruka and Yamaura are stopped by T-Set, who apologize, sort of, in their own way. That wraps a nice little bow on Haruka's central conflict. Other than her latest mother figure dying, I mean, the bullying conflict. In the end, justice and love overcomes evil every time. Speaking of evil, I mean, speaking of justice, Serizawa is waiting for Akiyama back at his office. This guy really gets around, huh? He tells Akiyama that the ones pulling the strings of Park's murder are an Omi Alliance front group called Osaka Enterprises. This group is associated with that giant guy from earlier named Kanai. Tracking them down sends us to a junkyard, and let me tell you, there's nothing in this world I hate more than fighting my way through goons in a Yakuza junkyard section, but these are the breaks. It's just made worse by the fact that these sections are defined by group fights, and Akiyama is the weakest in this regard. It feels like you're just chipping individual health bars down for ages, waiting for a precious heat move to knock off more than a little health bar. Eventually, Akiyama finds Ogita, looking a little worse for wear. He admits that he killed Park, not because of the money, but because he just doesn't like her. Hey, fair enough, man, I appreciate the honesty. It was Kanai that stepped in to make it look like she took her own life, and naturally had dirt on Ogita at that point. Rushing back to Sotenbori, Haruka has been kidnapped. No sooner is she taken than Katsuya brings her back, unconscious. I was dreading fighting through another warehouse, so I must say this is a pleasant surprise. Katsuya reveals that he is the president of Osaka Enterprises, and that Kanai acted outside of his orders, kidnapping Haruka. As for Park's former husband, it's Goro Majima. Wait, really? Hold on, let me do the math here. Jesus, dude, she was like 18 when he was 30. I'm not sure how much sense this makes. It does come across to me as a major plot convenience that's written as a revelation. For Majima to fit the bill of this mysterious husband does feel a little out of character to me, but it's okay. We just got to enjoy Yakuza in spite of these plot points, not because of them. Later, Haruka is awoken by a phone call from Katsuya. He wants Park's letter from Majima, and he's willing to threaten her in order to get it. There's something particularly eerie about Katsuya's threats, tacit or otherwise. Asagao 
He doesn't show a lick of emotion in any situation. It's like he sees all of his violence as a means to an end. This definitely fits a classic Yakuza archetype. His acting style reminds me of Beat Takeshi. You can just never get a read on him, and that makes you feel all the more nervous. In light of that, Haruka rushes off to the station to drop off the letter where she finds a reincarnated Oni waiting to drag her into the underworld. Akiyama is hot on her trail, as much as this is a perfect setup for a Haruka tiger drop. He arrives just in time to teach Kanai a lesson. Back at Osaka HQ, Kanai is punished for his inability to acquire the letter. <laughs> You really get a sense of Katsuya's presence when Kanai is tongue-tied and nervous around him. There's nothing in this series scarier than being offered a cigarette, and Kanai knows it, but it's like, at this point, you don't really have a choice. You know, there's a non-zero chance you're leaving this room in a body bag, but maybe taking the cigarette slightly lowers those odds? <laughs> The entire time he maintains his cool, his role in Yakuza 5 is relatively small, I mean, across the big picture, but Katsuya is one of the most memorable villains to me. His position, personality, and fantastic facial capture really sticks out to me as an imposing figure. Every minute he's on screen is entertaining. This chapter ends with Akiyama and Haruka heading to Kamurocha with the Japan Dome concert coming up. It's a lot easier to feel positively about Haruka and Akiyama's sections if you look at them as one combined thing. I think people largely agree that Akiyama's section is middling, but Haruka's is quite divisive. It's not hard to see why. Her side story amounts to a lot of busy work, should you pursue it to completion. And exchanging the series' staple combat for dance battles rubs many the wrong way. Honestly, I enjoy these sections quite a bit when taken together. The murder mystery is compelling, despite some missed potential in its implementation. Haruka's gameplay acts as a much needed break from the predictable fist fights and confusing conspiracies of other sections. Doubly true when you consider Yakuza's length. About 50 hours if you're halfway paying attention to side stuff. It's a long game and runs the risk of overstaying its welcome, so a break in style and some variety goes a long way. And Haruka's section acts as a bit of a reset after Saijima's messy chapter. Akiyama could still use a bit more love. He's such a charming character and a series favorite, but his role in this part is minimized. Still, for those who miss the standard gameplay formula, he offers a chance to live that out in Sotenbori with his own set of sub-stories and unique interactions. All in all, I think it was a risky but intelligent choice to deviate so much, and it results in a pretty enjoyable chapter. On the other side of Haruka and Akiyama's segment is one of the most truly unique stories told in the Yakuza franchise thus far. The chapter opens up with a professional baseball player walking onto the diamond, cheers of fans erupting all around him. This is Tatsuo Shinada, a player for the Nagoya Wyverns, and the star of this next chapter. It's a critical situation for the Wyverns. The game is nearly over, Tokyo Gigants just slightly in the lead. The underdog Shinada is sent to pinch hit. He locks eyes with the pitcher. It's on. I'm so hyped. We were just moving through the story of a pop idol. Now we're watching a baseball game. Couldn't be more captivating. I don't know a fucking thing about baseball. He fouls the ball. Over and over again, he fouls it. Shinada don't want no curveball. He wants a fastball. And a fastball he gets. It's a home run. You feel the excitement, the glory. Shinada's future is set in stone. His dream has come true. But it's all just a memory. We flash forward to the present day. Shinada is awoken in squalor. An angry debtor is waiting for him outside. What a contrast, and a great choice on the writer's part to show this fall from grace. We know so much more about Shinada's character in the present day from this simple interaction, but we're left wondering, how did it happen? Shinada feels a bit less sleepy when Takasugi, an apparent Yakuza, lets himself in. Before knowing too much about Takasugi or Shinada, they both come across as supremely entertaining. Takasugi has the presence of this old-school Yakuza you'd see on TV. He's flashy, charismatic, and intimidating. 
Shinada, on the other hand, is meek and apologetic, a joker who spends his time making excuses. Shinada makes his meager living writing articles for an adult entertainment website and promises to pay Takasugi back, but you get the sense that he's made this promise more than once. We're given some freedom to wander around our newest area, Kanaicho, a district of Nagoya. I'd say it's most similar to Nagasugai, with a city broken into utilitarian blocks of businesses, residential, and office buildings. You certainly do get some of that neon-soaked effect at night, but poorly lit corners, constant roadwork, and steam billowing up from sewers give the area more of a New York flavor than a Vegas one. In spite of that, it feels more like a close-knit community than anything we've seen. Well, okay, not Mountain Village, but city-wise. As Shinada rushes off to an interview, he's stopped by friends and seedy acquaintances. Unlike Haruka adjusting to Sotenbori or Saijima on the run in Tsukimino, Shinada really feels like he belongs here, and I like that feeling. Our first mission as Shinada has us interviewing an erotic masseuse named Milky. Boy, it sounds a lot more natural when Shinada says it. She's too upset to interview after her brother is being threatened by some co-workers, so it's Shinada to the rescue. We're given our first chance to mess with Shinada's combat here, and it is my least favorite combat style in the game. It's tough to define Shinada's style, it's kind of all over the place. There's a stronger emphasis on grappling and a few appropriately baseball-themed moves, like the slide tackle. The problem is that his crowd control sucks, worse than Akiyama for me. His damage output is low, and his options for heat actions are sparse. This leads to fights taking way too long. I guess you could compare him to Yakuza 4's Tanimura, both feel distinct from anyone else in their respective games. But where I enjoyed Tanimura's unique timing-based parry system, Shinada doesn't really have anything that engages in the same way. It seems pretty obvious that the designers were aware of his shortcomings, because Shinada is the only character who's actively encouraged to use weapons. You can find various weapons that never break, which is unique and kinda nice, but to compensate, they're all pretty weak. Your only crowd control option is often using a low damage weapon, knocking enemies off their feet and waiting for them to get back up again. Playing Shinada just makes me feel restless. Where Kiryu does everything pretty well, Shinada does everything sort of badly. He's given a tackle which uses heat in exchange for an automatic grapple, which is pretty nice, but the lack of counter abilities always leaves me feeling high and dry in the tougher fights. In any case, Shinada saves the day, freeing Milky. Yeah, that still sounds pretty weird to say out loud. For an interview, the two of them have a pre-established relationship, with Milky seeing herself as an old milkmaid, feeling like she's over the hill. Shinada, on the other hand, is a horny sweetheart who reassures her that she's aging like a fine wine. In all seriousness, Shinada doesn't come across as a pervert for perversion's sake. He seems like a genuine dude. It's interesting, most of the characters we play as in the series are top dogs, flush with money, power, influence, or otherwise having their needs taken care of. This is the first time we are in the shoes of some poverty-stricken Joe Schmo. He's relatable, and that makes it easier to slip into his shoes and appreciate the straightforward problems he faces. Girl problems, money problems, it's grounded in something more easily understandable for the average person. His story wipes the slate clean of conspiracy even more than Haruka's did, giving us an opportunity to meet and sit with this new cast of characters. I think some people are going to see Shinada's section in particular as detached, and I can certainly understand why. It has little to do with the overarching narrative, at least for the most part, and you might feel like it's a speed bump if you're itching to get to the bottom of things. If I was 15 when I played Yakuza 5, I'd probably hate this in Haruka's section. But, as an old man, I really do enjoy slowing things down a little bit. Every time Shinada finds a spare dime, Takasugi swoops in and relieves him of his newfound wealth. He is Shinada's personal Mr. Shakedown. You really get a sense of this desperate situation. Shinada hasn't eaten in days, he's being threatened by Yakuza. No matter what he does, he can't come out on top. Narratively, it places you in a real terrible situation. Gameplay-wise, I can't help but laugh as I make a shitload of money by completing sub-stories and side activities. It's too bad, I wouldn't mind experiencing the feeling of not being flush with cash for once in this game, but it is what it is. Aside from Tsukimino, Kanaicho is the most Christmassy of towns thanks to its Central Park-ish section. And as usual, it's just a real treat wandering around town into all these little corner stores and businesses. It really feels like Shinada's stomping grounds. I especially like this one pre-rendered background here. Such a cool aesthetic. We're given brief glimpses into the future Shinada could have had and left wondering where it all went wrong for his baseball career. That opening scene creates some intrigue, but there's an immediacy to Shinada's problems that distracts you. 
Occasionally it's like, oh yeah, baseball, what happened? And then Takasugi shows up and you forget again. Shinata visits an acquaintance in his restaurant where he learns all about some conflict involving the Tojo and the Omi. Various personnel from each were found dead in Kanaicho. For once it feels like a distant, somebody else's problem instead of something we need to involve ourselves in. Or is it? So Shinata runs into- That's Daigo Dojima. Remember when I saw Baba and I was like, am I not supposed to know that's Baba? Same deal here, am I supposed to not know that's Dojima? He literally just lifted his disguise from Suzuki, it's not even an original idea. So Dojima is looking for Shinada. Non-specifically, he's looking for an ex-baseball player. It's time for Shinada to confront his past head-on, it seems, and that's the face of a man who doesn't want to do that. Dojima wants Shinada to get to the bottom of the scandal that cost him everything. After the big game, Shinada was accused of sign-stealing and match-fixing. For those who aren't familiar with the sport, signs are used by the catcher to relay plays to the pitcher. Sign-stealing is when the opposing team, either through careful observation or insider info, steals those signs, allowing the batter to see exactly what pitch is coming. It's a bit of a legal gray area depending on the methods used, but match-fixing is obviously a big problem. That's when teams or individual personnel predetermine the outcome of a match by having one side purposely lose. It's used to nab big payouts while betting. Shinada was accused of these but was never found guilty, yet it apparently was enough to stain his reputation. He was let go from the Nagoya Wyverns, a past he's tried to shove aside for years. Dojima, for unknown reasons, offers Shinada 20 million yen to find out why he was accused and fired. It says a lot about Shinada's desire to bury the past that he's willing to turn down such a huge payday. That's a life-changing sum of money for him. But the mere suggestion of dredging up those memories causes him to fly into a rage. Oi, oi. Not Takasugi overhears and he won't take no for an answer. After this, Shinada literally cannot escape his past. A high school baseball teammate angrily tracks him down over some bad blood, forces him to head to the batting cages. We'll talk more about that momentarily. Giant TV screens show images of his coach from the Wyverns. Sports reporters recognize him. The pitcher from the Giants hunts him down. It's honestly comedic. He couldn't be more reminded of baseball. It goes from a past he tried to bury to a specter that haunts him every moment of every day. There's also this part where two salarymen beat the shit out of him in an alleyway because of a baseball-related argument. People in Japan take their baseball very seriously. So Shinada begrudgingly accepts the job. But you can take things at your own pace, go exploring, and enjoy the city a bit. Shinada's sub-stories carry a bit more personality than Akiyama's, mostly dealing with people in similarly destitute situations. You struggle with a job interview in more ways than one. Stop a young girl from prostituting herself and work at a convenience store while stopping shoplifters. It's largely more grounded stuff, offering glimpses into the lives of people in this less financially well-off area of Japan. No Santa costume though, 0 out of 10. Unlike Akiyama, Shinada's segment is given a full side story in the form of these batting cages. Now if you've played a Yakuza game, batting cages might not sound like much of a side story. There are batting cages in this very game, maybe you've used them already. But mechanically, Shinada's batting cages act in an entirely different way. Yeah, like all of the others, there is a story with its own cast of characters intertwined with the larger story. Shinada's side story feels a bit more like many sub-stories built into the framework of the batting cages, which makes for some pretty amusing side stuff. My absolute favorite is the one where you're approached by a sick kid. He's going in for an operation, but he's scared. Shinada promises to knock a ball out of the park for him if he'll be a big boy and face his surgery and the kid agrees to go face his circumcision like a man. This is one of the elite few jokes in the Yakuza franchise in which I didn't see the punchline coming from a mile away. I almost spit out my coffee. As for the game itself, it follows Yakuza 5's principle of simple but enjoyable. Whether it's a pitching machine or a human being, a baseball will come your way and you have to hit it. You get a bright spot within the square predicting where the ball will end up. You have to wait until the symbol lights up and then press the button corresponding with the right section of the play area. You'll get fastballs, curveballs, and you'll even get a beanball sometimes, which you have to dodge. The important thing is learning the appropriate timing, and not relying on knee-jerk reactions. As you level up through the side story, the hit areas become much more forgiving, and if you buy better equipment, it becomes downright trivial by the end. Like dancing, a higher level of optional challenge would have been more engaging for me. 
Nonetheless, it is a fun minigame that gives us some great Shinada character moments throughout its associated stories. I find it a lot easier to just continually play through these missions as opposed to hunting or taxi conversations, where I usually take short karaoke breaks or something. I vastly prefer it to the standard batting cages, simply because there's a visual indicator for optimal swing timing. Less guesswork. Once you've had your share of baseball-related shenanigans, it's time to solve the mystery of the lost sports career. Another investigation, less murdery, which appropriately tones things down for a Shinada section. As it happens, Shinada's had suspicions for years. It seems like the world was against him, and every time he came close to turning up answers, they mysteriously slipped through his fingers. There's a conspiracy afoot. The only link Shinada has to the Wyverns, however tenuous, is their ex-massage therapist, Uno. That's the guy who is beating down Shinada's door for money. You spend some time tracking him down with Takasugi, and I know it's been said, but Takasugi is such a fun character. He's more domineering and impatient than Shinada, on account of he wants his money back. But there's something more. He seems really curious about the baseball conspiracy, and you get the sense that there's some fondness for Shinada. His voice acting is also great. You can hear the words passing through his sagging cheeks. Makes him stand out a bit. During the investigation, some quote-unquote accidents straight out of a slapstick comedy routine nearly kill our boys multiple times. They find Uno. Who wants a body massage? Mr. Bottom Massage Machine? Apparently, he was fired around the same time as Shinada. As we poke for answers, the Yakuza are effectively ruled out as conspirators. After the scandal, regulation was introduced to stop match-fixing, which could only be a net negative for Yakuza. There's actually some real-world truth to this. Well, I mean, obviously there's some real-world truth to much of Yakuza. Much, but not all. To this day, match-fixing in sumo wrestling has resulted in more stringent regulation. Now that would make for an interesting side story. Shinada wants to move on from baseball. That's a logical next step. Anyway, the blame for these crackdowns can effectively be placed on Shinada, which might go to explain why everybody wants him dead. Uno's memory is jogged, and he remembers an altercation with a player named Manabe. Shinada and Takasugi head over to a restaurant owned by Manabe, who isn't too happy to see his old teammate. Reluctantly, he reveals some critical truths. Some Wyvern's games were, in fact, fixed. Anyone who tried to confess would turn up dead, so Manabe just kept his head down and did as he was told. The crew deduced that only one group would benefit from the result of Shinada's firing, the Nagoya family. After the Omi and Tojo were effectively booted from the region after the match-fixing incident, an unseen third family came out of the woodwork and started operating in Nagoya. I gotta say, this is a mystery that's grown on me over the years. The first time I played this game, I wasn't so keen on the Nagoya family plot. In retrospect, this section does a lot to hook you in and keep you wanting answers. There's a fine line between making the answers difficult to guess and making them frustratingly stupid. It's a line that Yakuza sometimes doesn't show much respect towards, but this keeps to the former side pretty well. Shinada asks Takasugi to introduce him to the head of the Nagoya family. You know, Yakuza connections and all. But Takasugi is strangely reluctant before admitting that he's never even met a member of the Nagoya family. He's been dropping their name to intimidate people for years, but he's not associated with them at all. Takasugi is not even Yakuza. Remember how I described them as a Yakuza straight out of a 1980s movie? Well, that's probably accurate. He looks and plays that part so well because his only experience with it is in fiction. This actually kind of makes me like him more. The idea of this white lie going out of control and becoming his entire personality, it's just too ludicrous. I love it. A stranger tries to kill the three guys with a gas leak, so Shinada chases him down. By the way, they've been using this fucking chase animation for three games now, just something I've noticed. The shifty man nearly spills the beans when suddenly... Hold on. He may still be alive. He's not. The one who dropped the steel beams was... yet another ex-teammate of Shinada's, Sakai. After beating him up, he coughs up some answers. Shinada has been sacrificed for some greater good, and you hate to see this perspective shot above. That guy's about to get crushed by some construction equipment. Oh, there you go. Shinada's been sacrificed for something, but one of his sacrificers has become the sacrificee. 
We flash back to that fateful day. It's after the game and Shinada signs a ball for a fan. That's Takasugi. I could see with my eyes that it's Takasugi. Am I not supposed to know that that's Takasugi? Maybe they should have given him some airtight disguise. Shinada is apprehended by police and dragged in for interrogation. Photographic evidence and a confession from an associate supposedly proves that Shinada was involved with the match fixing. If you slow down the tapes, you can see the exact moment that his dream dies. And there. Poor guy. There's a puppy dog innocence he portrays when he's sad that just makes you want to give him a hug. We flash back to current day. Shinat is doing research, putting together data from his ex-players. You see a determination and focus that was missing from him in the beginning. Confronting his past was the last thing on his priority list back then, but now it's giving him purpose. The hunt for truth has lit a fire in Shinada. It's pulled him out of his depression. We don't know how deep the rabbit hole goes, but at this point, it's the only thing giving him life. Shinada decides to follow up with Ushijima, who seems to know a lot of things about Kanaicho's underbelly. Suspicions that the Nagoya family sacrificed Shinada's career are nearly confirmed. But then, Milky calls. She's in trouble, so Shinada rushes off to help her. It was a trap, all a ploy to lure Shinada in. He's surrounded by all these friends and acquaintances. It's creepy as hell. I feel like they're gonna chop him up to be used in Manabe's restaurant or something. The Nagoya family aren't even related to Yakuza. They're a legend, a group of civilians trying to keep their town safe. A host club manager, a chef, an erotic masseuse, and a batting cage employee walk into a bar. They need to kill Shinada, but nobody's got the guts to do it. Ushijima said himself, he doesn't like being considered Yakuza. Shinada and Milky have shared real moments. It's all about protecting their community, but in doing so, they're stooping to lows that rival any Yakuza. It seems grim for Shinada, but things turn around as we realize that Takasugi is forklift certified. Oh Jesus man, relax, we're trying to defend ourselves, not engage in mass murder. The forklift is hijacked, and though the driver most assuredly does not have their certification, I gotta admire their ability to turn on a dime. She's built like a reach truck, but she drives like a pallet jack. This section is hilariously dumb. I literally cannot outrun the forklift. I don't really mind because the comedic value counterbalances the frustration. The fun doesn't last forever because this turns into a shipping container maze, replete with a hundred enemies that Shinada is ill-equipped to deal with. I will say you can get some slightly better Shinada weapons from Kamiyama Works, but it's only a marginal improvement. Just give me an infinite power Patriarch's driver and my feelings would change. Shinada is at a low point now. The sheer number of times this poor guy has had his trust broken is downright tragic. The deeper he digs, the more he loses. The more information he finds, the more he wishes to return to blissful ignorance. He's about ready to give up, but Takasugi won't have it. This is about more than debt collection. This is about friendship, truth, and admiration. Because, get ready for this revelation, Takasugi was that fan who looked and sounded like Takasugi from the earlier cutscene. You'd think maybe he orchestrated their whole relationship, but uh, nope, it's actually just a coincidence. How did he go from bright-eyed, bushy-tailed baseball fan to a loan shark in just a few years? He just kind of has the cadence of an innocent dork during the flashback. Maybe he was always this guy. Shinada has lost a lot, but he hasn't lost everything. He still has a fan, someone who believes in him. I like the self-awareness here. Shinada's just fed up with this shit. He's trying to keep a low profile, but every person he's ever met knows who he is. Unlike Kiryu, who, despite the fact that the entirety of Nagusugai knows his real name, pretends like Suzuki is still a rock-solid disguise. Manabe arrives to finish off Shinada, but, uh... Wow, well, this is a bit embarrassing for him. Manabe reveals the truth. The one who orchestrated the events of that fateful day was Shinada's baseball manager and mentor, Fujita. 
I drew a comparison to New York earlier, but I don't think that's accurate. I don't think there's anyone in the entirety of New York who would go to the same lengths to protect that city as these people will for Nagoya. Seriously, the level of dedication these people have in lowering the crime rate is downright impressive. Evidently, they're not really doing a great job. The city is still crawling with muggers, loan sharks, and murderers. Imagine if secret societies in America cared about their communities like this. Instead, it's all spanking rituals and Moloch worship. What a waste of taxpayer money. It's a painful realization for Shinada. Of all the instances of broken trust throughout the story, this one stings the most. Fujita was like a father to Shinada, seeing potential and giving him a chance when no one else would. Reporting back to Dojima, Shinada gives him the whole sordid picture of things. Dojima believes he knows who's pulling Fujita's strings, but before he goes, reveals his true identity. Wow, I can't believe it. It's enough that Shinada's entire friend group and every character he's met from the past dozen hours is either a teammate or a friend from high school, but Dojima-kun is also a friend from high school. Are there not private schools in Japan? I just find it somewhat hard to believe that Sohei Dojima, the patriarch of the Dojima family, would have his son attend the same school as Shinada. Maybe it's one of those he-needs-to-build character type things. Dojima here reveals a sacrifice of his own. Back in high school, their team was to play against the hooligans from Camaro Tech. Now these boys were tough as nails, see, and would threaten the opposing team. Dojima stepped in and beat them into submission, allowing the home team, including Shinada, to play in the finals. But this also resulted in Dojima's expulsion from school. The important thing is he protected Shinada's dream. This part is the most soap opera-y of all the soap opera parts to me, just in sheer convenience of this alone. The fact that they went to high school together is, I mean, it's kind of hard to believe. Now, it's not that I mind, it's not really too much of a stretch given the rest of this zany game, it just adds kind of another funny layer of melodrama over top of the whole situation. And another excuse to bring up dreams. Shinada cleans Dojima's fucking clock. His dream was taken away by Yakuza, and he doesn't want it given back by them. He's tired of being jerked around. Whether Dojima wants it or not, Shinada is tagging along. But I mean, he punches him so hard that the door breaks open and Dojima clears like 16 feet of air. If this were any series other than Yakuza, it might have left a small mark, but it's fine. All's forgiven pretty quickly. More unrealistic than that is Shinata's body. He's absolutely shredded, but it's been established he's lucky to have a cup noodle a day. They even try to explain it, which I appreciate, by having him talk about his daily push-up routine. But Jesus, man, this is just unreal. This is the power of Mark Ripito's starting strength and a gallon of Tarina a day. Anyway, when people take their shirts off in Yakuza, that's your sign that shit's about to get real. Space-time is manipulated in such a way that three layers of clothing can be pulled off with one yank, one of Yakuza's finest trademarks. Now, in what universe could an ex-baseball player who does bodyweight exercises every day get the better of Daigo, a man who gave even the Dragon of Dojima a run for his money? <laughs> Well, Yakuza, that's what universe. The two men agree they'll head to Kamurocho together to get to the bottom of who's the one pulling Fujita's strings. <laughs> it's a damn shame these two only get a little screen time together because they're perfect for each other. Shinada's immaturity pushes Dojima's buttons in such a hilarious way. I'd play a game starring these two, frankly. Shinada makes a sudden realization and bolts back to Wyvern Stadium. There, he finds Sawada, the pitcher on that day. You know the one. Before Shinada can move on to Kamurocho, he's got to tie up one last loose end. This scene justifies itself in coolness alone, finishing Shinada's chapter back where it all started. Turns out Shinada was stealing signs after all, but hey, that by itself is not illegal, it's just a little uh, sneaky. 
だから藤田さんは決断したのさ人生を黒羽組に捧げる代わりに自分にとって一番大切なものを守ろうってな。So it all comes full circle, or full diamond, I guess? Thank you. Thank you. Shinada and Sawada need to close the book on this unspoken rivalry. Just like last time, it's foul after foul, but we know it's coming. <coughs> It's also a good thing I was actually holding the controller, otherwise, that would have been a little anticlimactic. As it stands, it's an excellent ending to an excellent chapter. As a self contained story, Shinada's segment succeeds everywhere it matters. He's immensely likable, with a large cast of memorable characters accompanying him. Shinada brings his surroundings to life with this burning ember of optimism, no matter how dark the answers become. His side story is fun and appropriate, watching him interact with the townspeople is a treat, and, well, his combat isn't my favorite, but it's not horrible. It doesn't even come close to dragging the experience down. I'm confident saying this is my favorite section of the game, if for no other reason than it acts as a great, self contained story. He's a believable character that you can't help but root for, and I think it's a real shame that future Yakuza games don't even give Shinada the time of day. Even if it's just popping in to say hello, I wouldn't mind seeing his smiling face and unreasonably chiseled body every now and then. Entering the final chapter, we're given a scene of Fujita being murdered before he can confess. The assailant drops an Omi Alliance crest on the ground, no doubt in hopes of igniting a gang war. The return to Kamurocho is handled piecemeal, with each character having their own segment and reasons for returning to the famous stomping grounds. Kiryu beats the shit out of Baba for tailing him, and Baba explains the current situation with the Tojo and Omi. We've already familiarized ourselves with all the various power grabs. I mean, if you can remember that far back, that is. Kiryu's section was like a hundred hours ago, so a little refresher is nice. Basically, the Omi want to kill Kiryu and Saijima, seeing them as the Tojo's power source. Hold up, can they still call him the Slayer of 18? Bro is using a super soaker. New title is Man Who Intended to Slay 18. With the Omi chairman terminally ill, three families started to muscle in on his spot Watase, Takachi, and Katsuya. Saijima arrives, still having his strings pulled by Serizawa. He's forced to find information about Morinaga in Purgatory. For those who don't know, Purgatory is a hidden underground pleasure district owned by a man they call the Florist. I like it when it makes an appearance in these games because I'm reminded of the sheer insanity of this concept. Just the logistics of shuffling so many people through a sewer. I'm choosing to believe there's like a funicular somewhere. In Purgatory's Coliseum, we see Aizawa, who's supposed to be dead, at least according to Morinaga. He's agreed to fight in exchange for information on Morinaga, but he's going absolutely apeshit. <laughs> If even the city's aristocracy aren't enjoying bloodshed between the plebs, it's probably time to turn it down, bro. Saijima beats some sense into him as Yakuza 5's unofficial sense beater, and the florist decides to give Aizawa the information he needs. Morinaga also told us that Aizawa was dead, so. It's kind of hard to believe anything at this point, but the florist is usually the most dependable of information givers in this series. Now we get Akiyama's perspective, as this time he's being asked by Katsuya to cancel Haruka's concert. Going through the footage, I guess I got distracted because I left Akiyama sitting here in one of the most unintentionally funny, awkward silences in the series. They're just trying to get a read on each other. Katsuya knows pulling out of the concert will sabotage her career, but Dream, she's got dreams, and Akiyama needs to support her dreams. Meaning, of course, he turns the cash down. One has to wonder why Katsuya seems so bent on nabbing that letter from Haruka, having her show cancelled. One has to wonder many things in Yakuza 5. There are so many concurrent mysteries yet unsolved and plot points to untangle here. This is, in my opinion, the most obvious downside of having a five protagonist story. 
Balancing the volume of supporting cast with each character's self-contained story and tying it all together is a monumental task. Frankly, it's a task RGG isn't quite well equipped enough to handle. I don't consider that a swipe against the studio, though. I really respect the experimentation and ambition. I wish more studios stepped outside of their wheelhouse, but Yakuza 5 just doesn't nail the landing. The game is forced to remind you of major characters you last saw dozens of hours ago. It takes some uh, creative liberties with the story, knowing you've probably forgotten its finer points. It becomes increasingly tough to care about all these characters outside our immediate main cast, which isn't something you want to hear as a writer. As Akiyama heads back to Sky Finance, he finds Shinada waiting for him. <laughs> Now here's a dynamic duo. Shinada needs a lot of money, because he also wants to cancel Haruka's concert. He's got a good reason, though. Sawada believed that the Omi Alliance is planning on bombing the Japan Dome, and for whatever reason, the police don't believe Shinada. They talk to the Japan Dome's organizer, who reveals that Park and Katsuya had been working together behind the scenes. Haruka and T-Set are making their debut together, and it was all silently arranged by the two managers. The reason she traded T-Set to Osaka Talent is because they needed some fierce competition to find their own way. Well, I have to say, that plan relies on a lot of assumptions, but it's fallen into place beautifully. At this point, you could tell me Park predicted her own death, and I'd say, yeah, it makes sense. Park and Katsuya were good friends behind the scenes, which is corroborated by earlier remarks from Katsuya. Words that, at the time, seemed like lies to cover up his involvement in her murder. But Kanai really did act on his own in that regard, strong-arming Ogita and working without consulting Katsuya. Bear with me, following along in this plot, it's a hell of a thing. Even as someone playing the game, it gets tough following every thread around, trying to distill it, it's a job for an intelligent, handsome, and confident man, but I'm gonna take a crack at it anyway. Everyone is watching TV. Katsuya is announcing live that Haruka won't be making her debut, and T-Set is replacing her. According to the florist, Katsuya has been identified as a person of interest in Morinaga's death. Kiryu and Saijima both independently decide to storm Katsuya's compound, with a choice of who you want to play as. Even though I like Saijima's playstyle, I just can't turn down a chance to play as the Dragon of Dojima. It wouldn't feel right otherwise. This is a pretty long stretch of fighting, but at the very least, it's a visually interesting area. Most of these sections are like shipping container mazes, or construction yards, or empty office building. So having these huge, distinctive sections transition into one another helps this part stand out a bit. This is also the only mini-boss whose face I actually remember. I wish there was a heat action where you could just pull on his chain. That'd end the fight pretty quick. Whoever you decide to play as, the two boys will reach Ketsuya, followed closely by Watase. Interesting arrangement up here, why do I hear boss music? Ketsuya reveals that this was all a play. The four men needed to be together in order to lure out the real mastermind. By mastermind, I mean the one who killed Majima, Fujita, the Tojo and Omi men in Nagoya. The one who wanted Dojima dead, the one who almost killed Madarame. We are on the precipice of finding out the real villain's identity. Katsuya says, and listen to this quote because it's one of the best in the entire game, so brace yourself. Why? Why would you assume that? Did he tell you that you have to have a showdown? No, that can't be true. You are literally making guesses about his character. You should tell us why you think this mastermind is watching us right now. I'd have way more respect for Katsuya if he just said, I just want to fight you. I don't really have a good reason for it. He says, it won't do us any good to speculate. All we can do is fight. But the fight is speculating. Luring us here was, in point of fact, wild speculation. I don't know why we're assuming that he won't just kill the last man standing, but uh, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. I just find it funny. It's so clearly an excuse to have a cool rooftop battle. The justification they use, that's just kind of cute. We've established Watase is a man who loves a good fight. Kiryu and Saijima obviously can't turn this down either. Kiryu fights Watase and Saijima fights Katsuya. Kiryu and Watase fighting makes some thematic sense. Watase had great respect for Kiryu and from the beginning you could tell he'd relish an opportunity to throw down. Saijima and Katsuya doesn't quite capture the same feeling. Their stories haven't really intersected, so this fight feels more like a thing that's just happening because it has to happen. In any case, these fights are pretty good. 
By now you've probably done some Komaki training and learned a lot of great moves, so it's a good chance to put him to the test. It's not particularly difficult, in fact Saijima's damage just shreds Katsuya, but it's a pretty cool dual boss fight and fits into the Yakuza tradition nicely. They're like taking turns fighting? This isn't a fight to the death at all, they're just fighting until someone wins and then politely watching. Wasn't the point to kill each other? I feel like the game wants this showdown between Kiryu and Saijima to have some weight behind it, but knowing that nothing is on the line kind of spoils that effect. This fight will end with them both punching each other and falling over exhausted at the same time. See, even though everyone is alive, the mastermind finally shows himself. It's Serizawa, or so we thought. He's actually Tsubasa Kurosawa, the sixth and current Omi Alliance chairman. I can't think of a proof positive reason this would be true, but it seems to me that Kiryu or Saijima would recognize the chairman of the Omi Alliance. He looks pretty distinctive. I'm sure Aiji Okuda, the guy who plays him, gets recognized at the grocery store. I mean, I can just Google a picture of the Yamaguchi Gumi's current chairman. See? There he is! Kiryu and Saijima get recognized everywhere they go. But somehow this guy managed to maintain his cover, pretending to be someone else to so many different people? It's pretty embarrassing for Kiryu. He could have ended this game like 90 minutes in. He incapacitates everyone before he kills them so he can deliver his villain speech. I gotta say, he is kind of an interesting villain in comparison to some others. He doesn't care about honor, codes, or any of that stuff. He's actually disgusted by it. He has absolutely no problem using his own men and others to achieve his goals. That upright conduct that defines people's idea of the Yakuza is replaced with this borderline sociopathic instinct to use others. Katsuya was used, Watase was used, and of course, under the guise of Serizawa, he used pretty much all of the main cast. Shine. Katsuya is shot while trying to protect Watase, and then Kiryu says, you're gonna pay. You better find a rocket ship off planet, bucko, because when he says that, you are gonna pay. Daigo Dojima shows up in the nick of time to deliver another very long speech while aiming a gun at Kurosawa. Predictably, before he's finished, Dojima is shot by another party goer. This time, it's Kanai, apparently a double agent for Kurosawa. Kiryu screams in anger, watching as the man who's like a son to him is left for dead. But separated by thousands of feet, he's helpless yet again. Katsuya isn't killed, but ends up in hospital, alongside Dojima. See? Have no fear. No one's ever really gone. So, recap. Kurosawa is the chairman of the Omi Alliance. He found out that he was dying and began organizing this massive play to absorb both the Omi and the Tojo under one awning. To do this, he arranged for various sources of leadership and clan strength to be killed. Sometimes it worked out, sometimes it didn't. The letter that Majima sent indicated his whereabouts. It was sent after his supposed death, so actually, Majima is alive and well. Or maybe not. I guess we don't know. Katsuya wanted this letter to keep Majima safe. Kurosawa wanted it to find Majima, using Kanai by proxy. But the letter was just a trap to lure the conspirators out, which ended up working, as Kurosawa bit. Earlier I made a joke about how Park probably could have predicted her own death, but yeah, actually, she did that. That's why she entrusted Haruka with her pen, a key to the safe with the letter in it. I'm actually really glad we get these 20 minute long conversation segments. It's basically like, listen dummy, we know you didn't understand, so just shut up and let us tell you everything that happened, okay? Meanwhile, Haruka is still practicing despite her show being cancelled. The squad is still determined to manifest Park's dream and Haruka's dream into reality. That's when Nakai shows up with T-Set, prepared to extend an olive branch. 
明日予定しとった T セットの日本ドームでのメジャーデビューイベントは。As we already know, the plan all along was to have the girls perform under a supergroup called Dreamline. There's some understandable standoffishness given what Nakai has put everyone through. In the end, they agree to let bygones be bygones. T set even stopped being horrible. Haruka's mind is clearly drifting elsewhere, though. She can't seem to get a handle on the choreography. The boys are together at last, suspecting that the Japan Dome is in danger. Shinada's intimate knowledge of sign stealing plays an alternative role here, as he knows exactly where a gunman would have to set up to get a good shot at a stadium. Kiryu shows some vulnerability here for the first time talking at length about loneliness. It's hard to say exactly why, but Kiryu's circumstances in Fukuoka felt isolated, depressing. He says even prison didn't feel so crushing. Saijima knows exactly why. Kiryu was surrounded by brothers, mentors, and associates when he was actively involved with the Tojo clan. As stoic and independent as he comes across, he needs camaraderie as much as the next schlub. Saijima understands this all too well, as someone whose philosophy on family and brotherhood transcends the rigid conduct of the Yakuza. He's lost so many people along the way, but their spirits burn bright within him, guiding him on his own path. Now that our heroes are starting to get old and gray, the scene works exceptionally well. Substories often expose us to Kiryu's human side, but rarely do we see an opportunity to find that man who craves compassion and understanding from others. Conversely, Saijima is a man of quiet contemplation and folksy wisdom, but he has no trouble finding the words for Kiryu. A lifetime of experiences, wild, wild experiences, have given Saijima perspective outside of the Yakuza. It used to mean everything to him, but now his time there is just another tool in his belt. Kiryu may have once described himself as Yakuza to the core, but the boys are humans, family, friends, and so many other things before they're Yakuza. It's a meaningful exchange that never becomes overly sentimental, as these games are sometimes guilty of. We've got four handsome lads and time to kill before the concert. We're in Kamurocho, the pleasure center of Tokyo, and there's so much more room here for activities. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? I haven't talked about Kamurocho yet, so this is a good opportunity. Kamurocho is a district in Tokyo. It is modeled after Kabuki Cho, the real life entertainment and red light district of Tokyo. But enough of the technical information. What does Kamurocho represent? It's the epicenter of the Yakuza series. From the brightly lit streets of its 1980s nightlife to the numerous finales taking place in the famous Millennium Tower. The city has become inextricable from the world of Yakuza. It's densely packed with all kinds of interesting characters, locations, and stories to experience. It might not sound wildly different from any of the cities we've seen thus far, but Kamurocho is just special. It feels like home. Series newcomers might roll their eyes at the idea of reusing the same location through multiple games, but I promise it really does grow on you. There's sentimental value in knowing all of these street names and eating at the same noodle shops through numerous games in the series. There's nary a corner of this city where something wild hasn't happened yet, thanks to almost two decades of stories taking place on its streets. If cities could be comfort food, Camarocho is a grilled cheese sandwich. There are a few things worth mentioning about this iteration of the area. First of all, it's a bit disappointing that Yakuza 5's Camarocho feels so stripped down from Yakuza 4. I understand the game is massive already, but 4's rooftops and underground areas expanded the city in a satisfying way. It felt more like an authentic chunk of city in that game. There's also a real lack of sub-stories in this Camarocho, aside from a few stragglers from each character. Which means once again, the game never takes advantage of having multiple characters throughout these quests. Of course, there is the famous Amon clan, a reoccurring set of super bosses throughout the series. They're just as unbelievably annoying as ever. Basically, you just have to find a clever way to exploit some AI deficiency, and this isn't a get-good thing, okay? 
the amount of damage they can block is infuriating, and they can enter heat mode for what seems like an eternity. Also, your weapons break instantly if you ever try using them, so there's no way to make it easier on yourself. The odds are heavily stacked against you, so do what you can to survive. I recommend actually remembering to bring healing items for Kiri, unlike myself who for some reason carries almost exclusively Tauriners on my person at all times. There's also a host of activities in Kamurocho and elsewhere that I haven't mentioned. Remember that hostess from Saijima's Daydream? Well, you can meet her and have her force-feed Saijima Honeydew Melon until she's manipulated into falling in love with him. There's these hostess clubs in each city. It's a pretty simple minigame where you just try to select the right response and impress the hostess. There's bowling, batting cages, further training, a coliseum championship, darts, karaoke. When I heard this game was packed with content, I had no idea just how true that was. There's tons of other stuff that I'm missing here. Yakuza 5 is the series event horizon, where all potential sources of amusement have been absorbed into a singular product. Okay, well not the massage game, but I can manage without that one. Much earlier, I mentioned that Yakuza is best experienced at a leisurely pace. I hope that's making more sense now. Treating these areas like checklists or just bum-rushing through the story does a disservice to the volume of quality minigames on display here. Just uh, enjoy yourself, however you want to do that. Once you've had your fill of fun times with friends, it's on to the finale of the finale. This time, it's actually the finale edition. The Millennium Tower has been seized by an unknown group, and they've taken Goro Majima hostage. The fellas arrive at the scene, in a much less cool way than Yakuza 4 might, and chaos ensues. This is some pretty serious shit. I really didn't expect this chapter to open up with a mass shooting. It's taking a great deal of self-control while writing the script to not insert another rubber bullets joke, but I'll spare you, you're welcome. Kiryu and Akiyama put down the gunmen, and it's back to business as usual. That is, until they realize that these men are from the Majima family. Akiyama, shrewd as ever, believes that it was a false flag, somebody else trying to make Majima look guilty, run the Tojo out of town. The Low Poly Brigade shows up, prepared to assert their dominance by coordinating the same walking animation between everybody. Saijima decides to head after Majima, while Shinada volunteers to save Haruka. He knows his way around the stadium, and if there's a familiar assailant, he likely won't even know who Shinada is. This leaves Kiryu and Akiyama to clean up the mess on Taihei Boulevard. Once again, you're given an opportunity to pick your character. I choose Kiryu because he's trained for situations like this. At this point, you kind of flash back and forth between perspectives, from street level, down in the sewers, to the concert. That's where we get our first glimpse of Haruka's would-be assassin. It's Baba, clearly in a reluctant position, but unwilling to face Kurosawa's wrath. Saijima arrives on the roof of Millennium Tower. I'm sure he fought like 7,000 guys to get here, but I like that they didn't even show it. We went from sewers to rooftop, even the game is like, who are we kidding? He fucked them up. They trot out Majima for he and Saijima's inevitable battle. It's a low point for Majima, that's for sure. He's always so cocky and crazy, but right now, he's got nothing. There's a lot on the line for everybody, and that gently falling snow sets the mood for this scene so perfectly. So yeah, a fight, but the justification is decent. A live feed from Kurosawa's phone shows Baba's point of view. It's just a video of Haruka, but Saijima knows it's a threat. For his own amusement, Kurosawa wants to see them fight to the death. I guess he just thinks fighting to the death is neat. If Saijima wins, he'll let Haruka go, and Saijima will go back to prison for the rest of his life. It's a pretty epic showdown. This duel has been a long time coming, especially after Majima effectively cuckolded Saijima at the beginning of his chapter. This shadow clone jutsu always amuses me. I'm sure it's supposed to just represent Majima's superior speed, but I like to imagine he's like a necromancer behind the scenes. Explains why so few people in the series stay dead. With the inclement weather and that gorgeous cityscape in the background, this fight feels like a fitting finale for Saijima, even without the promise of closure most final boss fights offer. The two stop fighting much to Kurosawa's chagrin, but his threats won't work anymore. <laughs> Whatever happened in that stadium, it's thrown a wrench in his plans. We then flash back to the stadium. 
Baba thinks better of his ultimatum, stowing his rifle and walking away from that possible future. But Shinada decides to kick his ass anyway. That fight with Dojima might have emboldened him a little too much. Baba may have made the right decision, but even getting to this point indicates where his mind is. Shinada takes a page from Saijima's playbook, using his fists of fury to correct the deficiencies of others. Once again, for the third and final time, Baba gets his ass whooped. Not a bad final battle for Shinada, not at all. The battle finished, Shinada collapses from exhaustion. From so far away, there are only tiny glimmers in a sea of light. His own dreams that felt so big, that left such a void when they were ripped away, were only a glimmer of his own. Baba, now at rock bottom, puts a rifle in his mouth. <sighs> But he's stopped by Himura, his cellmate. The cellmates arrive just in time, accompanied by Kosaka. They bear a message from Saijima. The two of us can pay for our crimes in prison, as brothers. Baba had been judge, jury, and executioner of himself, attempting to find justice in his own way. But there's something to live for, Saijima's crown jewel, and that's family, blood or not. It's so cheesy, and I wouldn't have it any other way. A most satisfying conclusion indeed for our insecure little friend. Shinada's played his part. He's held the dreams of Haruka on his own back, and they've been fulfilled. Now he's got a dream vacuum of his own. Alone, poor, but not friendless, he gets a call from Takasugi. Tears run down Shinada's face as he realizes that he has purpose in this world. He dreamt of escaping that little plot he'd carved out for himself, but now he dreams of returning. He's so overwhelmed with emotion, he curls into a ball and just can't find the words. I'd be lying if I said this part didn't get to me too. There's something to be said for watching someone claw their way out of a depressive funk, and one can't do it alone. It's a terrific arc for one of the series' most lovable blockheads, but I can't help but feel like something is lacking. I'm talking about Fujita, Shinada's mentor. It feels like he was built up to play a larger part in Shinada's story, but because he was killed by Kurosawa, the plot thread ends with a whimper. Not even an acknowledgement on Shinada's part. A strange omission from the writers, but I'm still largely happy with this ending. Kurosawa's hand is played, and he's come up short each and every time. Dojima and Katsuya arrive as Kurosawa coughs up blood, a reminder of his impending death. His goal was to hand over a legacy to his next of kin. Who is that next of kin? Find out after these ass kickings. Akiyama settles his informal rivalry with Kanai in a boss fight that isn't quite as awesome as the others. It's mostly because of these other goons. Akiyama doesn't handle the crowd fights well, so it feels more like a punishment than a dazzling final boss. While the fight itself isn't too cool, what is cool is the scene that follows. Matarame, Kitakata, and Watase arrive, their respective armies in tow. Their target isn't Kanai, though. It's Akiyama. He was already a badass, but this is certification. The man's had a long day, and this is a pretty rad reward. There's still one big loose end to tie up, though. Who's waiting for Kurosawa's empire to be handed down? Kiryu arrives at Tojo headquarters, stepping over a trail of bodies left in this person's wake. He opens the door and finds... No. All of this build-up? Dozens of hours? The man who's supposed to match the Dragon of Dojima is Aizawa? A guy I literally forgot was a character until the last chapter reintroduced him? Briefly reintroduced him? Aizawa is nobody. The idea that he's Kurosawa's son, okay, I'll need to jump through some hoops, but I'm willing to accept that it was a long play on his part. 
This is just way too sudden, and even Aizawa doesn't know what the fuck he's doing here. This game is already like a hundred hours, would it have killed them to introduce periodic context? Maybe show us what's going on behind the scenes? How has this guy I handily defeated become a living god? The real sting here is that the fight is actually pretty cool. His design is awesome, he's got great screen presence, and the fight itself is one of the coolest in the series. But he was just some nobody, and then the story told us that he was a somebody, and now we're supposed to believe his relative power level is at this soaring peak. Hours ago, he was demolished by Saejima. We were given some sense of his bloodlust, but not his skill or cunning. Am I to believe he was holding back? In context, Aizawa actually has potential. I understand how this thematically fits with the idea of dreams. It's just handled with carelessness. Because of how underutilized, unexplored, and frankly unexplained his aspirations are, he comes across as cheap. The only reason to believe he's there to carry on Kurosawa's torch is because the game clumsily informs you that this is the case. There are some parallels being drawn. He has a distaste for outdated Yakuza rituals, just like his father, and doesn't believe Dojima is strong enough to lead the Tojo. But there was no indication that he felt this way until now. It's like two different characters, but not in a clever way, like a man can change, character change is a staple of great fiction, but there has to be reasons, we should see that change, we should learn about those characters and empathize with their struggle, even if it is a villain. But Aizawa changed because it's convenient and provides us with a final boss who isn't his father, an old man with cancer. Now on to the good. The fight itself earns its place among Yakuza bosses. Having the battle take place across Tojo headquarters gives us this great sense of finality to the game. We started out as far away as possible from Kiryu's past, but we're right back where we belong here. After fighting the Amon brothers, this feels pretty straightforward, but it's still a good time. There's something about Aizawa's fighting style that just feels so rhythmic and satisfying to engage with. Taking this fight outside to Tojo's courtyard, all of that blood-stained snow, is a memorable visual from this encounter. While this fight is happening, Dreamline sings their first song. Okay, this shit is beyond parody. As Haruka sings of her desire to return home with Kiryu, he's out killing another man's dream. Because sometimes, one man's dream can be another man's nightmare. Haruka, having fulfilled Park's dream, chooses an unexpected path. She acknowledges the past of the man who raised her and I'm sorry, but could this crowd look any more ridiculous? <laughs> There's like four character models, they look like zombies. Haruka bows out of idle life, deciding that family is more important than fame and fortune. She runs off stage, and the credits roll. Afterwards, we return to Kiryu's perspective. He slowly bleeds out onto the snowy streets of Tokyo, his consciousness fading. He sees an angel, it's Haruka. Their reunion cut short as Kiryu loses consciousness. Is it just a dream? Is she really there? In hindsight, it's a very strange cliffhanger to leave Yakuza 5 on. They already blew their load with this false Kiryu death ending in Yakuza 3, so I'm really not sure what the goal is here. From here, you can enjoy New Game Plus or Premium Adventure, which allows you to tie up loose ends and play another minigame. The ending makes it seem like Premium Adventure is just a fever dream cooked up by Kiryu's subconscious as he bleeds out. Kind of puts a damper on the whole thing. The Yakuza series is not an easy sale for the uninitiated. I can think of no other game that better encapsulates the phrase, greater than the sum of its parts. It's easy to scoff at the game's numerous quirks, and it's not always the easiest game to take seriously, but its heart is undeniable. It's a love letter to its developer's home country. A virtual tour so charming, you really do feel like you come out of these games with some first-hand experience of the Japanese nightlife. The characters are great, the music is hype, and its plot twists will shock you as often as they'll make you laugh out loud. All of its finest qualities and all of its most glaring flaws are amplified in this fifth entry. Beyond being a series sampler platter, there's something about Yakuza 5 that kept drawing me in. Something that I had trouble verbalizing. This review was in part because I wanted to know why it is that this game sticks out in my mind, years after having first played it. I don't know if I'm any closer to the answer than I was before I wrote this video. A game so focused on dreams, both literal and figurative, Yakuza 5 has invaded my own dreams, a messy, diverse, wonderful, and stupid scattershot of ideas. It just draws me in. Its creativity and ambitions often become too big for its breaches, overshadowing the grounded, character-focused stories being told and tripping over itself as often as it succeeds. Maybe that's why there will always be an upper limit to this game's appeal in the West. 
Despite its shortcomings, it's a game that matters. If the industry doesn't have risk, ambition, and outrageous dreams of its own, it falls into mundanity. Every mini-game, sub-story, and newly introduced character is a tiny glinting light that contributes to the greater whole, and Yakuza 5 burns brightly indeed. Maybe that's why I'm drawn to it. A series of bright lights in big cities, Yakuza 5's lights burn the brightest and its cities are the biggest. I mean, symbolically. I know Kamurocho is both brighter and bigger in other games, work with me here. The Yakuza series has, at last, found an audience in the West. A Yakuza fan wants for nothing right now, with a steady supply of new games and a whole library of old games conveniently available on your platform of choice. But there was a time when Yakuza's grandest adventure had to be fought for by fans. For those who love the essence of video games or curveball stories starring oddball characters, I can't recommend Yakuza enough. Don't ask me why though, it's just something you need to experience for yourself. Originally, this video was supposed to be like an hour and a half, but once I started writing, I knew that that was not gonna happen. This game is just too damn dense. I thought it'd be easier to talk about since it's made up of so many parts, but there was some surprising difficulty in writing this. I hope you enjoyed the video regardless. I'd like to first thank all of my patrons. I really appreciate all of the support, especially given how long ago I started working on this video. I'd like to thank, in particular, those in my Persons of Lordly Caliber tier. Adam Safranco, Matthew Sean Dick, Banana Turnip, Sleepy, Avil and Hime Takamura, True Manalist, Scatmouth, Spencer Kennelly, I'm Emil Castanier's number one fan, I am getting used to saying it, Captain, BB Squirrel, Emmy, Buster Drew, Franzwath, Fenrir Lives, Xeno Gears, Olo Shadow, Guko, Random NPC, and Jordan Laughlin. Honestly, I couldn't do it without all of you. Your support makes these videos possible. Both, if you're interested in helping the channel out financially and netting some different bonuses, please consider pledging at patreon.com slash magular. And to you all, I say thank you for watching. It's a pleasure to entertain you, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss future uploads. Until I see you next time, stay healthy, wealthy, and wise.